This reading continues with The Castle of St. Donat's or the History of Jack Smith, Volume 2, Chapter 8, after yesterday's cliffhanger. One of the men, looking over some rough boards, exclaimed, Oh, oh, damn the rogue! Old Broom has got him tight enough! And our hero now clearly perceived a poor wretch firmly locked in the arms of a muzzled bear, who, rubbing his head against his captive, endeavoured his best to give him a friendly salutation. The wretch struggled like Antaeus in the grasp of Hercules. His face was black, his eyeballs as if bursting from their sockets, and his body compressed into a washbish size. The man who had spoken leapt over the boards into a place which had the appearance of a pigsty, and with the assistance of our hero, who followed him, extricated the captives from the clutches of the bear. In another part, where some hurdles made a division, there was an old sow and five young pigs, who appeared not a little alarmed at the disturbance which had taken place. The miserable white, being extricated from his perilous situation, was still in the most piteous case. A profuse distillation from every pore and aperture of his body was evident to the senses of the company. He trembled in every limb, his features were convulsed, his look wild and haggard. After repeated questions, he burst forth, looking fearfully at his auditors. Oh, and, and I, am I escaped out of its clutches? Am I really? Oh, I thought the devil had hold of me and was carrying me away to hell. I won't, said the man. You thought the old gentleman had got you fast, did you, before your time? What, you'll still poor people's pigs, will you? Oh, Lord, said the other. Indeed, indeed, I'll never steal again. No, I believe not, replied the man. You'll travel, my boy, to Botany Bay. And then, if you don't take care, some of the wild gentlemen there will give you another squeeze without that pretty muzzle that mine has got. Aye, right, but... Where be the rest of the young pigs? said the other man, who was much older than the one who had spoken before. The thief, somewhat recovered, confessed he had stolen them, but offered to make every compensation in his power, and most earnestly begged, as he had suffered so severely from the bear, that they would give him his liberty. Smith inquired into the particulars of the case. The man who appeared the owner of the bear answered him, oh, Your Honour must know as we, as how that I was going to wail fair with this here, my dancing bear, and so not being able to get to any sleeping place tonight, and the fair not beginning till tomorrow, I asked this here old man to let I and the bear sleep in his hut. Now, you must know, sir, he has got only one room in a pigsty, so we parted the sty, gave my old chum his supper, put on his muzzle, and tied him at one side, and drove the sow with her five young uns to the other. Four days ago, half the young pigs belonging to the litter were stolen, and tonight, you see, this young jack and apes must comfort others. Well done, old broom. Just put a stop to his pig stealing, and I shall have to have a good breakfast for it. Such was, almost verbatim, the explanatory speech of the owner of the bear. The thief had suffered very severely, not only from his fright, but from the rough paws and muzzle of the enraged animal. His face was smeared with blood, some of his teeth were loosened, and his clothing being torn to rags, the impressions of the warm hugs in wheels, bruises and scratches were evident. At Smith's intercession, backed with the powerful argument of two guineas to the old man as a compensation for the loss of his five former pigs, which were very young, and not worth so much, the fellow was pardoned, and the master of received also half a crown for the thief-catching abilities of his animal. But it was not our intentions, it's not our hero's intention to turn the culprit again loose into the world. He doubted the permanent effect of temporary fears, and therefore, as the condition of releasing him from Durin's file, the thief was to be sent to any regiment our hero should approve of when he came to Salisbury. Smith was obliged to wait at the hut till the morning to find his horse, which the daylight discovered, quietly grazing near the spot, though somewhat to the annoyance of the bridle and saddle the former of which was broken, and the latter exhibited a few green and brown marks of rolling. The animal being caught, Smith proceeded with the to-be soldier towards the pleasant city of Sarum. The towering spire of the cathedral pointed out their course, and the bear's dancing master set off at the same time for that well-known fair of tricks and traffic, fun and folly, at Wayhill, a few miles from Andover. Bruin's master, not a little elated with the success of his prospect, exhibited in broad characters in the front of the savage these words, which he himself in full clear and deep toned notes repeated. This is the wonderful bear that caught the thief that stole the pigs that belong to the man that lives in the hut that is on the plain that's near the road that leads to the noble city of Salisbury. The address succeeded most wonderfully. The whole fair flocked to the site and cash flowed in from all quarters. Fame indeed, 
has said, and what will fame not say, that the lucky white, having gained a fortune by the abilities of his capering chum, is now retired with his bear from any further toil, and erecting an elegant mansion for himself and his shaggy friend. That individual building which is now going forward, so near the metropolis, and which so many lovers of architecture lost in astonishment at its use and purport, which this account explains, ride to view on a Sunday. I return to our hero, who, having executed his commission concerning the pig stealer to his own as well as the man's satisfaction, set about his inquiries after Mr. Modley and his party. But it all proved to no purpose. And tired in body, distressed in mind, he returned to his inn. The perturbation of his spirits, his spirits had suffered within the last eight and forty hours. The violent exercise he had taken, together with the wandering all night upon the bleak downs, brought on a fever. The coming symptoms Smith totally disregarded, the consequence of which was that it increased upon him so rapidly in the night that he became light-headed, and a physician was sent for by the people of the house. Having lost all traces of Mr. Modley and his fair daughter, he was very reluctantly compelled to give over the pursuit and by the care and attention of his physician, he was able to return to Oxford in less than a week. His journey and consequent illness had given full extent to the conflicting storms that raged within his soul, and by the time he returned to Oxford, his pride came to his relief, and a kind of sulky despondency took its place. Again, he read over the two letters from Miss Modley and Mrs. Herriot, and as he was not yet inclined to condemn himself of vanity, he began to fancy he had not been very civilly treated, he now began to think that they had purposely looked out for this excuse to break off the connection, and that his fair mistress had not lately been so kind as formerly. He fancied it was a concerted scheme, which it was in some degree, and cursed his own folly for being so easily made the dupe. Not that he believed for one moment that Miss Modley joined in the plot, but he concluded she was deceived as well as himself. Amidst all the wildness of our youth, his good opinion of Miss Modley was never shaken. If true love consists in implicitly believing that the fair object of that love is superior to all others, no man could be more true than our hero. He knew his adored mistress might be misled or deceived, but not for a moment would he entertain the idea that she would willingly act wrong. There was a generous principle implanted in the heart of our hero, never to be mistrustful or suspicious, and though the manners of the coxcomb hid many of his excellent qualities, it did not destroy them. There is no part of a young man's conduct that is more disgusting to his common acquaintance than that self-sufficiency which is so conspicuous in the habit inhabitants of a neighbouring country. And I firmly believe it is this affected ease and consequence, for it is a mixture of both, that makes the petit maître so disagreeable to John Bull. But among our more intimate acquaintance, when we know the innate virtues of the man, we no longer despise him on that account. We even laugh at and sometimes almost admire these trifling airs of the coxcomb. Smith's natural good temper and disposition, so excellently improved, gained him a great many friends, while the manners he had so lately adopted gave him an unpleasant appearance of pride that could not fail to offend those who were but little acquainted with him. Buoyed up, buoyed up by a thoughtless set around him, in whose circle, as he had always been the life and spirit, he was considered as a little oracle, he began to be more and more indifferent concerning the late unlucky affair. When his passions had a little cooled, his vanity induced him to consider it in a less serious light, and Whiffle, who had been present at the time, laughed it off and cried, Amartya, etc. Oh, the cause of lovers, or a renewal of love. Sims, too, took off Sir Sandy so nicely that he set the whole company in a roar, and his friend Lord Edward was quite enraged with Mr. Modley for the haughty, unforgiving spirit he had shown. But the unrestrained temper of Sir Harry, ever on the search for novelty and dissipation, afforded the grand cordial for his grief. In short, with these able advisers and assistants, Smith soon drowned his cares and quietly determined to take the first opportunity and explain the whole business to Miss Modley. He had never been favoured with the friendly acquaintance of the other gentlemen, and he little cared for their kind opinion, provided he could reinstate himself in the good graces of his charming mistress. When he read the letter from Miss Modley once more, the most difficult charge to overcome was the having boasted of her affections. And Mrs. Harriet, having so pointedly mentioned the same thing, he felt the injury his vanity had done him. He saw his error plainly, though he scarcely liked to own it even to himself. At the same time, he mentally resolved to be more careful for the future, and when once more the beloved idol of his soul had forgiven him, to be more modest and prudent. That he should be forgiven, he did not like to entertain a doubt, and looking forward to that time with pleasure, he was in hopes in the space of the next vacation to clear up the whole. And therefore, 
He launched forth into his late bad habits. The exercises of his college were now despised. He was never at home more than was absolutely necessary. And as he was continually spoken to for his neglect, absence, etc., etc., he quite lost the favour of his superiors. He affected to vie with the most expensive men in the university, and had for some time kept a horse of his own. But as yet he had exceeded in no degree worth noticing his income, for his good sense had plainly told him he had not the means to continue it. His expenses were more in show than any real extravagance, and the money he had so strangely received kept him at present free from debt. But let it not be supposed that this young man was corrupted by bad company. Every one of his acquaintance had full as much right to throw the charge upon him. Lord Edward was much more moderate in his conduct, Whiffle and Sims were more giddy than systematically imprudent, and Sir Harry was rarely at college. It is not so much bad company that is in itself the cause of a young man's ruin, as that growing depravity of manners which lends him into those societies, leads him into those societies where the restraints of virtue, morality and religion no longer confine him. When ambition and folly are once united, their slave becomes ridiculous, contemptible and lost. Witness the numbers of our young men, who instead of being respectable citizens, a name any Englishman may glory in, are ambitious to shine at the court end of the town, and unnecessarily exhibiting themselves in Bond Street, St James's, the lobby and the park, when they lose that decent character which fortune had assigned them, and stamp themselves fools for life. Chapter 9 Epigraph he sees, he likes, and what he likes pursues. So the staunch hound amid the tainted dews winds his fleet prey. Orlando Furioso, Book 24. Lord Edward Cashison, who was very fond of hunting, generally joined the foxhounds when they threw off within a few miles of Oxford. One fine morning in the spring, he had rode to see a bag fox turned out before the Abingdon Harriers. The day was so inviting that a great many Oxonians, from the dignified head of the college to the more humble scout, joined the party. If, reader, thou hast ever seen the Epping Hunt on Easter Monday, thou mayst readily conceive the nature of this, which, though not so numerous, was equally as motley as the other. But if it has never been thy lot to see that annually exhilarating scene of fun and folly, if unhappily thou art thyself no sportsman, I earnestly advise thee to apply to thy most knowing acquaintance in that line, whose pleasure in describing it to thee be too great for me to, to wish to anticipate him. The fox was turned out as near Oxford as possible, that it might be an inducement to draw more company from thence, for as the half-crowns were collected from each spectator before the sport begins, no inconsiderable sum is gained in the course of the season to assist, assist defraying the expenses of keeping the hounds. A vast number of foot as well as horse were assembled on this occasion. I forbear to enumerate them, though many of our friends were in the number. As Lord Edward is the hero of the day, I propose keeping him as near him as possible. Renard acquitted himself in a capital style. He took straight across the country and crossed the water boldly, while the number of two-legged pursuers sufficiently retarded those with four to give any hopes to the old sportsman of their ever coming up with him. Lord Edward was mounted on a famous young horse and rode in spirit and courage not inferior to Dick Knight himself. If the reader wishes to see how, I refer him to those excellent prints of that far-famed huntsman, where, having tired three horses, he comes in at the death upon the fourth forehorse of a team that he luckily fell in with on the road. A gentleman not unknown to fame, and to whom all the members of the university are obliged for the amusements he has afforded them, by his frequent riding of races in Port Meadow, was also with the hounds. Mr. Filmer, a character very unlike my Lord Edward, was, what is commonly called, knowing in everything that might properly be named sporting. In the language of Mr. Whiffle, he was up to all the tricks and jockeys of, and grooms, whether common grooms or groom porters, whether common jockeys or the jockey club. Filmer was very well acquainted with the country where the fox was to be turned out. He had consulted the weathercock before he left the stables and could give a pretty good guess which direction the animal would head. He had chosen his horse for the day's sport accordingly and considered him the best leaper in England. Filmer came into the field with a determination to set Lord Edward. The scent lay breast high, the hounds, in defiance of all obstacles, as soon as they had cleared the foot people, clung to it, and went on at a high rate. The steep banks, stiff hedges, and deep double ditches soon threw out the greater part of the company. Now, now, my lord, said Filmer, when the hounds began to get ahead, we shall soon try your young horse. Filmer, with his old hunter, rode on, straight over everything. Lord Edward, on his high-mettled colt, boldly followed, 
and having received one capital tumble of the double ditch, to the great entertainment of the other who caught his horse. The animal learned experience from his misfortune, and being again mounted became more cautious, and carried his rider in safety over every obstacle. The two gentlemen arrived at the river's brink together. Lord Edward, a little irritated, though not hurt at his fall, said to his competitor, Now, Filmer, we shall see your courage, and passing him at the moment leapt boldly into the river. The other coolly pulled up his horse, remarking that he was not so young as that, and as the dogs were puzzling by the side of the water, he rested content where he was. Lord Edward's horse soon recovered himself enough to swim to the opposite shore. His lordship jumped off upon the ground, and with a little assistance the horse got up the bank. He looked around him. None of the dogs had crossed, nor were they likely. Many of the field were now come up, and as they did not choose to cross themselves, they were not disposed to try the dogs the other side, and to let them go off without them. Filmer laughed heartily at his lordship and hallooed across the river. Well, my lord, I hope you will kill the fox, for the dogs don't choose to join you. His lordship, who was very wet, took it all in good part and answered, No, I shall not try, but make the best of my way home and learn prudence from you another time. You see, the water has cooled my courage. Good morning, and good sport to you. His lordship, having squeezed the wet from his clothes, mounted his horse and proceeded homeward at a very good rate. He was about four miles from Oxford on the London road, when a female voice from the other side of the hedge suddenly stopped him with the simple monosyllable, Sir. He perceived a young woman, decently dressed, between two men, whom he instantly recognised as two of his own college. I'm sorry, sir, to stop you, said the, sir, said the young lady, but you have the appearance of a gentleman, and I hope will release me from the insult of two persons who whatever may be their appearance, are certainly not gentlemen. His lordship had no need to speak to them, for the others, conscious they could not defend their behaviour, had already left the fair maid. A countryman coming up at the same time, his lordship gave his horse to the man, and leapt over the hedge to his new acquaintance. To his offer of protecting her home, she replied, I've not got far to go, sir, to the next village about half a mile, and will with many thanks accept your politeness. His lordship offered her his arm, but the young lady modestly declined it, and recollecting the water, he did not think proper to press her. When they entered the village, she again thanked him for his trouble and took her leave. Not so Lord Edward. He was too much captivated by the unknown to leave the spot so abruptly. He took his horse from the countryman. He was a long time finding some silver to give him. Now, oh, do you know that young lady, my friend? No, sir, or you don't belong to this village. The saddle was not sufficiently tight, the stirrups were too short, and he continued by various delays of this kind not to mount his horse till he had perceived the fair maiden turn into a small bricked cottage at the bottom of the street. Not seeing anyone to inquire of and feeling the cold from his wet clothes very troublesome, he made great haste home with the determination to return on the following day. Lord Edward's acquaintance with the fair sex had never been among the middle station. He well knew the Lady Betty's, Fanny's, Arabella's, Charlotte's and all the honourable misses of the day, nor was he ignorant of the fawning civility which the lower ranks pay to a handsome young nobleman. But the blush of modest innocence, the easy and decent politeness of a well-informed and sensible mind, the unaffected and natural effusions of the heart were quite novelties to him. No wonder, then, do they forcibly struck his soul from the pair of lovely blue eyes which animated the countenance of Mary Rosier. Mary Rosier's father had been the lieutenant colonel of the mm, regiment, but an early habit of gaming had ever been his bane. Mary's mother, whom he had married for love, died in childbirth. The infant was put out to nurse and afterwards to school. At fifteen, her father took her home because he could no longer afford to pay for her education. His circumstances were ruined. His lieutenant Kelsey had been long sold and gone. Upon a trifling annuity of fifty pounds a year, he was slowly dying in a little village where he had retired for cheapness. The clerk of the parish's wife, who lived next door, officiated as a servant for a trifling gratuity. But Mary was his comfort, his nurse, his only delight. The colonel had, at no period of his life, been a man of any great abilities or fine feeling, but he could not consider without concern the leaving unprotected his duteous daughter. He had long been discarded and unnoticed by his noble relations. The day after the hunt, Lord Edward failed not to take his intended ride and slowly he passed by the house where the fair Mary had entered. All the way he had endeavoured to find some excuse for a call, but uncertain who or what she was, he was as far as ever from the point. 
a little public house at some distance determined him to put up his horse, and the church being near, he strolled into the churchyard. As he was looking over the different gravestones, with his thoughts busily employed on the things of this world, a plain middle-aged man, whom he soon found was the clerk, came up to him and inquired if he wished to see the church. We have a fine monument lately put up, sir, said he. All the gentlefolk round about come to see it. Lord Edward, who wished for an opportunity com to converse with some of the parish, accepted the officer. Well, this, sir, said the man, pointing to a very sumptuous monument, was erected to memory of one of this parish, who, with only five shillings in his pocket, went to London to seek his fortune. He first got into the service of a builder, at last succeeded his master. About ten years ago, he came down to his native place, bought the estate of Lord Laidacres. Packduckers, situated in this parish for fifty thousand pounds. He died, sir, about a year ago, and in his will, to the great displeasure of the family who were proud, left particular orders for this monument. Here you see, sir, all the tools of his business, and pizzanatchets and saws and gimlets, etc., etc., etc. Here, sir, you see him going up to London on foot, with a wallet at his back, and there he is again in a coach and six, returning to his native country. He's left six sons and one daughter. How much longer the clerk's speech would have been, I will not pretend to say. Lord Edward was completely tired of the unmeaning story, and catching at the word daughter said, with seeming indifference, well, I suppose that the young lady I saw going into a brick house the other side of the public house, distinctly pointing out the place. Ah, no, sir, that was Miss Mary Rosier. I dare say Miss Perkins would give half her ten thousand pounds to be so pretty. She might give all the rest before she would be half so good. Well, who is this Miss Rosier? said Lord Edward, of whom you speak so highly. Well, I can scarcely tell you, sir, replied the clerk, except that Miss Mary's father is a colonel. I believe he ruined himself by gambling. And so, being very ill and very poor, he came to live here, next door to me. For my wife lived servant where Miss went to school, and Miss wrote to us to get them a house, and we got them that, it was the old vicarage, for six pounds a year. Lord Edward, by his attention to the second tale, made up for his deficiency of the first. In some degree satisfied, he forbore to ask any more questions for the present. He liberally rewarded the clerk for his trouble, and was still irresolute in going back to the public house, when he met Miss Rosier. Her face was crimsoned immediately she saw him. He politely addressed her, not without a little confusion on both sides, and she answered him. Then, speaking to the clerk, she said, Mr. Bright, my father wishes to speak to you. The clerk left the churchyard. The young lady slowly followed him. Lord Edward was by her side. He felt himself pleased, yet was at a loss what to say, but determined to improve the present moment, he apologised, for what needed no apology but had been her own act, believing her at the entrance of the village, and not seeing her home on account of his wet clothes. This brought forth inquiries on the part of the lady that he had caught no cold and such like civilities. But it is tiresome enough to hear the self-interesting conversation of an enamoured youth and his mistress without the greater drudgery of committing it to paper. Let it suffice to say that Lord Edward expressed in the most civil manner his wish to cultivate an acquaintance so auspiciously began, and understanding she had a father from the clerk, he should be happy to be introduced to him. The colonel's health prevented him at present, and he was about to send a polite message by the daughter when he felt a repugnance to calling himself by his title. At the same instant, the fair Mary, wishing to find his name, begged to know to whom she was obliged for his civilities yesterday and today. His lordship answered his name was Cassison, and Mary Rosia soon after, speaking to him by the name of Mr. Cassison, he begged she would make his compliments to her father, and when he was well enough, he hoped to be introduced to him. This was the very thing his lordship had wished, to be acquainted with the colonel and his daughter, without the distance-keeping title of a lord. He now took his leave, and with a light heart rode back to Oxford. He continued frequently to ride that way, and a few days after was introduced to the colonel. His daughter having before mentioned the origin of their acquaintance. Without daring to ask of himself the motives of his conduct, he embraced every opportunity to be in the company of Mary Rosier, in whose excellent heart he soon gained a preference, for which he was neither indebted to his title nor connections. Leaving Lord Edward to the progress of his passion, I returned to our hero, who, with abilities to shine in any station, was playing the part of a fool and a coxcomb. Chapter 10 Epigraph. Fatally fair they are, and in their smiles the graces little loves and young desires inhabit. 
but all that gaze upon them are undone, for they are false, luxurious in their appetites, and all the heaven they hope for is variety. One lover to another still succeeds, another and another after that, and the last fall is as welcome as the former. Row. The fourth year of Smith's residence at college had now commenced. His present situation was already independent, and his connections seemed to promise him every advantage that a young man of good person, temper, and abilities could desire. His disposition was naturally good, and had been improved by the watchful inspection of Mr. Freeman. But the insinuating habits of dissipation had so far increased upon him that his conduct to that gentleman was little less than ungrateful. The truth was, he was so very far from being able to justify the whole of his behaviour even to himself, that he dreaded the scrutinising eye of such a man as Mr. Freeman. About this time, Smith, with some others, were noticed by the proctors for... But I cannot enter upon particulars. The papers, indeed, are now before me, but I must pass over the ungrateful talk of tracing this thoughtless young man through the particulars of his more foolish, in this instance, than flagrant conduct, and simply say he had his degree put back a year. In this one respect, following the examples of Freeman, Smith was more offended than affected at the circumstance, and ashamed to go to Mr. Freeman in Wales, he set off to London with the partners of his disgrace. Thus, as will always be the case, one fault leads us into another. And I know no one thing that occasions more mischief in the world than that false shame so common in young minds, and which prevented Smith from retiring to his friend in Wales. Without saying a word to the superiors of his college, the youth departed and took a ready-furnished lodging near the theatres. He had been about a week in town when Sir Harry Valance came up to spend the winter months with his mother. He insisted that Smith should have an apartment at his house as long as he remained in London, and told him he should be greatly obliged to him if he would spend the winter with him. Smith accordingly wrote to Mr Freeman that a very unpleasant business had occurred which prevented his going to Oxford for some time. He was at present in London, and if Mr. Freeman had no objection, he should accept an offer made by Sir Harry and remain at his house the whole winter. He received a very friendly answer from Mr. Freeman, who slightly mentioned the Oxford affair, and said he should at all times be happy to see him at St. Donat's. The Dowager Lady Valence was very infirm, and seldom came out of her own room except sometimes to dinner. The young men, therefore, did just as they pleased, and, unconfined by hours or ceremony, had a very good time of it. Such a companion as Smith was the very thing Sir Harry wished, and together they frequented all the polite and public amusements of the town. Sir Harry also introduced our hero to the houses of many people of the first fashion, and their time lightly passed away, regardless of the morrow. Smith gave himself no more concern about Oxford than if he had never been there, and seemed to have forgotten that he was yet a student of C.C. One evening after Christmas, Sir Harry and Smith went together to the play, they had not sat long in one of the side boxes before two very beautiful women and a gentleman entered the opposite box. Sir Harry, with marks of great surprise, looked towards them and asked Smith, whose eyes were fixed on the same objects, if one of them was not a very handsome woman. Smith answered in the affirmative, adding, I see you know them. Well, yes, replied Sir Harry. One of them I know very well. We will join them as soon as the act is over. Oh, well, who's the lady? If you never heard of the ci devant Lady Marley, Farley, she is but lately come to England since the divorce. I was in her ladyship's good graces before she went to Italy, which was about twelve months ago. I don't suppose she has quite forgotten me. Which is her ladyship? That on the right hand. <laughs> but in my opinion, the other is a most beautiful creature. I was looking at her all the time. Well, I'm glad to hear you say so. Our interests won't clash. Come, let us join them. Sir Harry, on entering the box, said, I hope I have the honour of seeing Lady Farley in health. Oh, Sir Harry, cried the fair lady. Is it you? Why, I'm pretty tolerable as times go. Let me leave, added Sir Harry, to introduce you to Mr Smith. I return your compliments, Sir Harry, Mrs Sherville. Our young men now seated themselves in the ladies' box, and the person who had attended them into the house, and who, in short, was no better than a servant out of livery, went home. Whilst Sir Harry was entertaining his old acquaintance, our hero conversed with Mrs. Sherville. Mrs. Sherville was a likely, sensible woman, not deficient in ability, but of strong, uncontrollable passions. 
She was very young, had eloped a few months before from her husband with a gay youth and officer, the son of a gentleman of great family and fortune, and flew with him into Italy. But she soon found him a stupid, unpleasant companion with a great deal of outside show, a dashing fellow who drove a phaeton, kept a showy set of horses, but with a mind equally as unimproved as his groom. She quickly determined to leave him, and meeting with Lady Farley, who was coming over to England, she coolly told him of her intention and left him to take care of himself. She knew he would not follow her, as a trial for Crim Con had taken place in their absence, and he had been cast in damage of ten thousand pounds, which his father had absolutely refused to pay, and for which Mrs. Sherville's husband threatened to arrest him the moment he came to England. Leaving him, therefore, to solace himself with some other frail fair one, equally as grateful as herself, she took this opportunity of getting rid of him. She was, at present, on the lookout for some protector, and Smith seemed the man that exactly suited her taste. Exclusive of his person, which no woman could find fault with, his ready wit and sometimes keen satire greatly entertained her. At other times his clear and judicious remarks, but above all his well-timed flattery, insensibly stole into her heart. In short, by the time the play was over, the party were too well pleased with one another to think of separating. The young men, with pleasure, accepted Lady Farley's offer to supper, and Sir Harry's and her ladyship's carriages conducted them to the house. Smith, in raptures with the attractive charms of the fair wanton, so forcibly urged his suit that the lady continued not long to play the prude, and our infatuated hero, in the arms of his new flame, soon forgot his adored Miss Modley. Few young men, and perhaps not many old ones, can oppose temptation, but young and old may easily keep out of the way of it. Smith had totally given himself up to the destructive libertinism around him before he became acquainted with Mrs. Sherville, but he had formed no attachment. The case was now greatly altered. The insinuating blandishments of that fail fair one crept into his very soul, and without attempting to control them he gave himself up to his licentious passions. After Mrs. Sherville had been separated from her husband, in consideration of her being the mother of his two children, he had settled two hundred a year upon her for life that necessity might not lead her further astray. Mrs. Sherville in no other light regarded money than as a means of indulging herself in the course of dissipation to which she sacrificed everything. When she had first encouraged the youth, she was in hopes, like his friend, he was a man of fortune and expectations who would be able to support her in her beloved extravagance. But at the time she found the contrary, from Smith's own account of himself, she was too much involved in the snares of her passion, too much taken with the youth, and the better pleased with his candour to drop the connection on that account. She was glad also to show her disinterestedness. The flame for our hero burnt so bright at present she could even think of love and a cottage, and the only thing dreaded was the idea of losing him. He was the first person she had ever really liked. She had married her husband because the offer was advantageous, and that she might escape the control of her friends, who, knowing the warmth of her disposition, kept a watchful eye and she had afterwards eloped with the young officer, caught by his outward trammels and eager to enjoy that dissipation her prudent husband restrained her from. Sir so Harry seemed as much taken with his frail one, and few days passed in which they were not together. One evening Smith attended both these obliging females to the play. Sir so Harry had promised to join them at the conclusion, and to go in a party to Ranley. A hero sat in a front box between the ladies with the effrontery of a young man who thinks it adds to his credit, to be noticed by two fashionable impures. The danglers of the playhouse, from that veteran in dissipation, though perhaps young, an officer in the guards, to the spruce country beau just entered as an apprentice in town, viewed him with envy. In vain did the more dashing bucks and more impudent coxcombs endeavour to force themselves into the notice of the ladies. Perfectly satisfied with their present attendant, they repelled every address with scorn, while Smith, with the triumphant vanity of youth, smiled at their ineffectual attempts. The white arm of Mrs. Sherville lay familiarly on his shoulder, and gently tapping him on the cheek, she said, Look, tell me, do you think that a pretty girl? With a mixture of exultation and conceit, as conceiving himself the general object of envy, he turned his head round, and an instant encountered a pair of eyes, more soft, though far brighter, than either of his companions could show. A pair of eyes that glared not with the fiery blaze of impudence, but where modesty, like a soft veil before the sun, hid their piercing rays. Need I add, their fair mistress was Miss Modley, who sat with Mrs. Harriet, her father, and constant attendant, Sir Sandy, in the stage box. The vanity of youth was crushed at the sight. 
he answered not a word, and if he had carried his head a few inches higher before, it was now doubly depressed. A moment or two had scarcely passed since he had thought his situation the most enviable in the house. Now would he have exchanged it for the very lowest in the one shilling gallery. His countenance changed, the words faltered upon his tongue, and his fair companions, alarmed, inquired if he was ill. Stammering, he confessed a sudden giddiness had come over him, and anxiously he looked round in hopes Sir Harry would enter, that he might, under that excuse, leave them for a while. This was denied him. Chained to his present spot, he faintly looked towards the ever-beloved object. As his eyes met hers, one glance she gave him, which pierced to his very soul, then indignantly withdrew them, as if contaminated by the touch. In this distressed situation, Smith sat till the end of the play, nor was the situation of the lovely girl much less distressing. Though she had before rejected him, she had never banished all thoughts of him from her breast, nor had determined to unite herself to another. But the present degrading scene urged her to be more resolute. Who his companions were, she could not be ignorant, as Mrs. Sherville had lived in the same village as her father, and her whole history was well known to them all. When the play was over, Miss Modley complained of fatigue from the heat of the house, and begging her father to retire, went home with very unpleasant thoughts. Alone in her own chamber, she gave full scope to her tears. When they had in some degree subsided, her resolution came to her aid, and she calmly prepared to resign all thoughts of Smith for ever. To accept of Sir Sandy was a hard task, but she resolved, in obedience to the anxious wishes of her father, no longer to repulse him, and she doubted not in a little time, completely to overcome her former unworthy attachment, and to be prepared to receive him for her husband. So reasoned the lovely girl, while her unworthy lover, involved in the labyrinth of a new passion, ventured not to trust his thoughts towards her, and as the frail vestal who has broken her vows thinks with horror of that heaven she concludes she has for forfeited, so when the idea of his ever-beloved Eliza crossed his mind, he felt a shuddering at his heart that told him his loss with redoubled force. Chapter 11 Love's comfortable like sunshine after rain, but lust's effects is tempest after sun. Love's gentle spring will always fresh remain. Lust's winter comes ere summer half be done. Love surfeits not. Lust like a glutton dies. Love is all truth. Lust is a forged lies. Shakespeare, Venus and Adonis. When the spring came on, Mrs. Sherville and our thoughtless hero agreed to go to some watering place. Lady Farley was angling with a matrimonial bait for a rich old gudgeon, and Sir Harry was gone into Devonshire on particular business. Smith, therefore, had taken lodgings at Margate, and left town at the same time as Sir Harry. A few weeks of constant residence with his fair one had greatly allayed the ardour of our hero's passion. He still liked the person of the lady very well, but her temper was at times very violent, and though she was fond of him to excess, she showed a want of principle that he could not at all approve of. Smith emerged in the vortex of dissipation, yet continually found that strong principles of virtue, which had been early planted in his soul, return upon him. He was never, when he reflected one moment, satisfied with himself, and he would willingly have returned back to the paths he had quitted. But the fascinating endearments of Mrs. Sherville lulled the argus of his conscience, and he had not resolution enough to rouse himself from his stupor. While the simple youth thus resigned himself without a struggle, his noble friend Cassiusin was conducting himself with the nicest honour and virtue. His frequent rides alone had not escaped the notice of his acquaintance. His tutor had known them some time. The very morning before Smith left college to go to town, he breakfasted alone with his lordship. From a deep reverie, Lord Edward suddenly broke his silence by exclaiming, I'll be damned if I do. The devil at that moment was tempting his lordship to take advantage of the evident return of his partiality for Mary Rosia and the poverty of her father by carrying her off. But his honour was true and genuine. It was neither the substitute of virtue nor the cloak of vice. It was neither a defence to pride nor a dagger to poverty. No, it was the faithful mirror of those virtues which wanted but occasion to introduce them to the world. How easy a prey, whispered the tempter, couldst thou make of Mary Rosia? An annuity for life would repay her pretended loss. I'll be damned if I do, exclaimed his lordship. Smith smiled, and Lord Edward, recollecting himself, told his friend the particulars of his late attachment, and accounted for the exclamation. 
To Smith's natural question, what he meant to do, he has naturally replied, he did not know. Well, his grace, Smith will never consent to the match. I fear, I, I fear not. Well, you would not marry her without. I'm a younger son and have not sixpence independent of my father. Well, necessity then seems to compel you to break off the connection. Prudently, a young man can reason in another situation. You have, I suppose, said Lord Edward gravely, given up all thoughts of Miss Modley. Your proof, my dear friend, is very just, continued Smith. But though I loathe the physic myself, may I not offer it to my friend? Well, I find it equally as unpalatable. I think Mr. Plausible knows of your attachment. Why so? Well, he asked me yesterday as I met him crossing the quadrangle if he was in your room, and I told him, no. I suppose, said he, with his usual smile of knowledge, he is taking his evening ride on the London road. Well, I shall have a lecture from his grace then in a day or two, concerning the family pedigree, my brother's follies. Oh, this meddling plausible. I shall scarcely be civil to him. No, give him his due, my lord. He's behaved very well on the whole. You know he never lectures you himself. Well, he knows I will not bear it. Consider him as your father's friend. Well, his spy. <laughs> well, as his friend or his spy, it is undoubtedly his duty to inform your father of the connection. You alone see the favourable side of it, my lord. Be the seeming disgrace. Mr Freeman, do you think, be a tail carrier to my father? Replied Lord Edward. Hmm. You perhaps suffer Mr. Freeman to speak and advise with you on the subject. You see the difference, I'm sure. Well, if he tells nothing but the truth, I'll forgive him. Talk of the devil. Here he comes. Mr. Plausible had been, by his grace, appointed tutor to Lord Edward. He soon discovered his young pupil's temper and acted accordingly. His hopes of preferment originated from his grace. The favour of Lord Edward was, a was but a secondary consideration. He was quite a man of the world and had no passions nor habits that did not yield to the lust of preferment. He was, in a full, in a few words, almost in everything a contrast to Mr. Freeman. The young men were standing by the window as they perceived him crossing the quadrangle, and he soon entered the room. I've just received a packet from his grace, said the tutor. This is for your lordship. Smith was going out of the room, and Lord Edward stopped him. Stay, Smith, I'll walk with you presently. Here there are no secrets from you. Then turning to Mr. Plausible, well, sir, you have thought proper to inform my father that, repeating from the letter, you have undoubted intelligence I am forming an imprudent connection with a young woman near Oxford. And pray, sir, who told you so? By my authority, my lord, I wish not to divulge. Let me ask your lordship if it is true. Well, supposing there was some truth in it. What a very respectable office you have taken upon you, Mr. Plausible, of spy, an informer. Well, much better, I think, my lord, than that of a silent pander. Pander? Sir, Miss Rosier, I would have you know, is as pure as virtue itself. Well, I'm happy to hear you say so. Your lordship is easily offended, but I shall not attempt an exculpation where there is none necessary. If I had courted your lordship's favour and encouraged you in the connection, regardless of the consequences, I might then have had your lordship's thanks for a little while. But I should have gained the merited reproach of your noble father, and sought in vain the approbation of mine own heart. I wish you a good morning, my lord. Now, I beg one moment, sir. Will you not tell me who informed you of what you are pleased to call my imprudent connection? Your lordship must excuse me. If I repeat anything that is not true, you shall have my author immediately. But since I wrote to his grace, I have heard of your visits to Miss Rosier from many gentlemen. I beg, Mr. Plausible, you will not use the term. My visits to Miss Rosier. It's a very unpleasant sound. And when you next write to my father, you may assure him I value her honour and character as much as I do my own. All right, today, my lord, do you really wish me to say so? I do indeed, sir. I shall obey your lordship. Good day to you. Now, 
said Lord Edward, as soon as his tutor was gone. Oh, right, to Mr. Freeman. To Mr. Freeman? said Smith, surprised. About what? Well, about Miss Rosier. The poor colonel's dying. Mary has no friend. You see the delicacy of my situation. No one can advise me so well as Mr. Freeman. I shall beg the favour of him to come to Oxford. Lord Edward accordingly wrote. This was his letter. My dear sir, the proofs I have already had of your friendship induce me still further to trouble you. Do, my best friend, come up to Oxford and aid me in protecting a lovely, lovely young female whose father, a lieutenant colonel in the army, will be, I fear, before you receive this, no more. Excuse my writing particulars, and you shall be acquainted with every circumstance when I have the pleasure to see you. On this you may rely, that were it not a case of the utmost honour and respectability, Mr Freeman would be the last man I should apply to. My dear girl never knew a relation but the one she must soon lose. I have no proper friend among the mad-headed set around me, but you I know will come and be a shield to the honour of my Mary. Your presence is the answer desired by your ever-grateful friend, Caffison. My father knows my attachment by means of plausible who has refused to have anything to do in the business. Mr Freeman, to the great joy of Lord Edward, immediately came to Oxford, about a week after Smith had left the college. The colonel was alive but insensible, and died the next day. Poor Mary left an orphan, could not but feel her loss. Her father's relations had all forsaken her. Her mother's were not rich, and lived in a distant country. For the colonel had married her mother at Charleston, when he was with his regiment in the American War, and she survived the birth of a daughter but a month. With no one to fly to, or, or to advise with, Mary not sensibly felt the prudent attention of her lover in bringing such a man as Mr Freeman to her protection. Mr Freeman had a maiden aunt that lived about 30 miles from Oxford, and he proposed to Miss Rosier to reside with her for the present. To this the young mourner gladly consented, and the day after the funeral of her father accompanied Mr Freeman to his relations. Mr Freeman thought it proper to inform Miss Rosier who her lover Caffeysin really was, which the modesty of the youth had prevented his doing himself. In the pleasant and hospitable town of Swindon, she was kindly received by Mr. Freeman's relation, and the great civility and attention of the neighbourhood daily lessened the loss she had received. But the most grateful cordial to her soul was the polite and respectful attention of her Edward, who, knowing the delicacy of her situation, never presumed to see her but in the presence of Miss Morton, Mr. Freeman's relation. Lord Edward, in a week, returned to Oxford, and the same day his friend set off to St. Donat's. The satisfaction which arises from an open and upright conduct is as far superior to all that the gratification of the senses can bestow, as the ingenious bloom of native innocence surpasses the florid cosmetics upon the cheek of a modern belle. Chapter 12. Epigraph. But where are they, the worst of villains, viper-like, who coil around the girlless female, so to sting the heart that loves them? Them, the spirit replied, a long and dreadful punishment awaits, for when the prey of want and infamy, lower and lower, still the victim sinks even to the depths of shame. Not one lewd word, one impious imprecation from the lips escapes, nay, not a thought of evil lurks in the polluted mind that does not plead before the throne of justice, thunder-tongued against the foul seducer. Joan of Arc, Book Nine. As soon as Mr. Freeman returned into Wales, he called upon the Duke, considering it his duty to inform him of what had taken place, for he had before told Lord Edward he should so act. His Grace had already heard of Mr. Freeman's going to Oxford, and for what purpose. After Freeman had been introduced, he thus began. I'm lately come with Grace from Oxford. Lord Edward desired me to make his respects. Your visit was purposely sir, to my son. It was, Your Grace. A strange office, I think. He is chosen for his friend to take the care of his mistress. Your Grace does not use mistress in an improper light. I know but one in which my son can form a connection with a poor country girl. I presume, Mr. Freeman, you don't mean to marry them. I hope your grace does not suppose I would interfere in any connections in which the motives were not honourable. And do you really mean, sir, to encourage my son to marry her? A very friendly office indeed. I am proud, continued Mr Freeman with rather an emphatic asperity, 
in being called Lord Edward Caffysyn's friend. I flattered myself your grace had a better opinion of me than to suppose I should encourage your son in any hasty and prudent connection, and to disregard the consent and opinion of his father. I have heard, Mr Freeman, from very good authority that you had yourself taken this young woman since the death of her father to a relations of your own, that Edward had visited her frequently. Your grace has said very true, except the word frequently. Then I think, sir, you have acted with the greatest impudence, not to use a harsher term. As your grace, this continues to condemn me. Without knowing my motives for acting as I have, I shall not attempt to intrude any longer upon your time. Mr. Freeding, Freeman accordingly made his bow and was about to depart when the Duke, recollecting himself, apologised from the anxiety he was in about his son Edward and begged Mr. Freeman to relate the particulars. Mr. Freeman proceeded. When Colonel Rossi was on his deathbed, your son wrote me this letter. And he gave the Duke the letter, who, having perused it, begged Mr. Freeman to continue. As Lord Edward's friend, I instantly obeyed it. Prudence would have taught me to have done the same. Coercive measures, your grace, which could not restrain a boy at twelve, would but irritate him at twenty. I've no doubt, had I refused, that he had, without thought or scruple, only waited the young lady's consent to have made an immediate marriage. You're very right, replied the Duke. Excuse a father's warmth. Edward is my last hope, so proper the family. Where is this Miss Rosier? At a respectable relations of mine, Your Grace, at Swindon. My Lord Edward attended the lady there with me, and he promised not to leave college again till the vacation. I had no right, Your Grace knows, to demand any promise of him. His own sense of the propriety induced him to make it. Oh, Mr Freeman, I am greatly obliged to you. I see you have acted right. I think Plausible has done so too. How would you advise me to proceed, to put a stop to this unpleasant affair? I cannot think of it going any further. Such a soul as your son Edward, your grace, must have often found cannot be trusted too liberally. You must not attempt to restrain and forcibly prevent him. Not prevent him? Candidly tell him your grace's objections. Beg of him at least to delay all thoughts of matrimony till he is of age. Your entreaties will go farther than your commands, and promise on your own part to provide handsomely and independently for Miss Rosier. Provide for Miss Rosier, did you say, Mr Freeman? Unless Miss Rosier, your grace, is out of the reach of poverty and want, Lord Edward will agree to no conditions. I will send for Edward immediately home, and beg for the present you will continue your care of the young lady. Your son proposes paying his respects in the course of a fortnight. I told him I should wait on your grace, and he desired me to say so. Well, Mr. Freeman, I am greatly obliged to you, and I will take your advice in the whole business. Let us now return to the hero of my tale. Mrs. Sherville's natural love of extravagance could unwillingly be confined to a retired spot, and she sighed again for the amusements of the gay world. The pecuniary circumstances of the party, too, began to fail, and made a separation more necessary. At this period, Mrs. Sh Sherville received a letter from a friend in Italy, wishing her to join her there. The lady was just married to a noble fool of vast fortune whom she had met upon his travels, and whom she managed exactly as she pleased. Mrs. Sherville mentioned the circumstance to Smith, and an intention of going over to her friend, and the youth gallantly offered to see her safe. It was settled then that Smith should accompany her to Turin, and Mrs. Vassell's husband was to meet her there. Smith was induced to leave the kingdom for a little while, from displeasure against the magistrates of the university, by whom he concluded himself ill-treated, and therefore he determined not to return to his college till the year of disgrace was over. His passion for his frail partner, so far from increasing, was diminishing very fast. He wanted something to support it. Vice, under a pleasing form, may for a time charm away the heart, but it is virtue alone can retain it. Few of the virtues fell to the lot of Mrs. Sherville. Fair, few the fair lady thought worth the gathering. Yet it was by the aid of one of them that she held Smith so long in her chains. Generosity was the best trait in that lady's character. Far from a mercenary disposition, she liked the youth for himself alone. 
and although she knew he was utterly unable to support her in her beloved pleasures, yet she had rejected many advantageous offers for the sake of accompanying him to Margate. Smith knew this, and would not be ungrateful. Since it was necessary to part, he thought the least he could do was to see her safe to her friend. And though he and the lady had no particular quarrel, he looked forward to the time with pleasure when he should be freed from what he had begun to think a burden to him. In defiance, too, of their intended economy, the lady's two hundred a year and his allowance had not been able to maintain them. Smith had contracted debts in London to the amount of nearly two hundred pounds. Part was for apparel for himself and presents to the lady, some for articles of housekeeping, which, under the idea of cheapness, he had had sent to him at Margate, and no small bill was due to the wine merchant. How these bills were to be paid was another thing, but the different tradesmen who had seen him with Sir Harry were so very civil that he had little care on that account. When he thought of St. Donat's and his worthy friend there, it was quite different. He wished to write to Mr. Freeman. He wished, in some degree, to account for his long neglect, but Smith had written but once when he first came to town to that gentleman since he came from Oxford. Many a letter, indeed, had he attempted to pen, but as he sacredly regarded the truth, he had not been able to form one to his mind, and for the few last months he had more and more despaired, and at last given up his intention. So Harry was at this time paying his addresses to a Miss Maitland, a most elegant and sensible young woman, the only daughter of a country clergyman. Mr Maitland was the younger branch of a very noble family, and besides his living, living given by his noble relations, he was possessed of five thousand pounds to bestow with his daughter. No great fortune indeed, but Mr Maitland had married for love, and the last thing Sir Harry thought about was money. The young lady did not receive the tenders of her admirer unmoved, and had refused many very respectable offers on his account. Sir Harry was, at first, very anxious to hasten the match, when the sudden death of Mr Maitland gave a check to his affair. The property he had re reserved for his daughter had rashly been placed in private hands, which he thought unexceptionable, with a gentleman of large landed property, and also concerned in a very reputable bank. The great run upon the banks had involved this also by the treasury, treachery of a clerk to whom the business was trusted. The landed property of the banker was entailed, Miss Maitland's intended fortune was gone, and Mr Maitland, whose health had long been bad, yielded to the blow, and in a few days expired. A relation of the family immediately informed Sir Harry of the event. The present possessor of the family honours had never noticed Mr or Miss Maitland, and Sir Harry's worldly friends had always dissuaded him from the match. Sir Harry was a man of the world, and though possessed of a most excellent heart and understanding, had suffered them both to be greatly corrupted by the licentious manners of the age. He had long thought of gaining Miss Maitland for a mistress, but the respectability of the father had deterred him. No ob obstacle now remained, and certain of the affections of the young lady he had little doubt of succeeding. Not that his love was at all abated for the fair object, but he dreaded the ridicule of the world if he married a portionless young woman without family or friends that noticed her. All his ideas of love and happiness he hoped to realise the same if she were his mistress as his wife, and while his pride forbade his marrying, his vanity was highly gratified at her being his mistress. Everything honourable, according to modern terms, he proposed to settle, a handsome annuity and such like salvos for his conscience. The moment he heard of Mr Maitland's death, the loss of property he had heard before, he wrote to Miss Maitland, offering his services, with forced excuses for not coming himself. The letter was sent by his own servant from Town Express, and enclosed a note to the value of £500. Believe me, my dear Miss Maitland, said he, I consider my property as yours, and as the great unexpected pecuniary loss made recess you in money matters, I hope you will not refuse the enclosed trifle. But permit me to throw myself and mine at your feet, happy to be disposed of by the fair mistress of my heart. Miss Maitland was much hurt at the language of the letter, at his writing and not coming himself, and with cold thanks returned the note, informing Sir Harry that she had still sufficient to clear every debt of her father's, and intended in a few days to retire to a relation of his mother's in Devonshire. This relation was in low circumstances, a mantua-maker in a country town as her mother had been, and it was this degrading alliance which had alienated her father from his family. From the wreck of her father's fortune, Miss Maitland could only collect about £600. This a friendly attorney advantageously, pay, advantageously placed in the funds for her, and she immediately set off to her aunt, who kindly received her. 
Her intention was to employ herself in the same business as her relation, conscious that her small property was not enough to support her beyond the common necessities of life, and not willing, though a false set of notions, to live in a state of proud and idle poverty. Sir Harry soon followed the lady, surprised at her conduct, he yet believed from her present situation that few obstacles would retard his brilliant offers. It was some time before Miss Maitland clearly understood him. She still hoped his views were honourable, though his manner of behaving was rather suspicious. But the moment she was conscious of his intentions, she not only refused them with the utmost contempt, but with all the spirit of offended virtue dismissed him forever. She had permitted one interview after she perceived the base nature of his proposals, which she fondly hoped would conclude the affair to his satisfaction. How greatly was he surprised when he perceived a gentleman and lady besides her aunt in the room, before whom she thus addressed him. That you once had my affection, Sir Harry Valence, I still avow, but your infamous offers have restored me to myself. Henceforth, we meet no more. The time may perhaps come when you will regret that you have sacrificed to vice and fashion the affections of a fond female, inferior to you. I may without vanity say, only in fortune. Farewell, Sir Harry. Farewell forever. With an agitated though a determined heart, she spoke. The young lady then turned into another room and gave free vent to her tears. Sir Harry was all astonishment and departed without saying a word. On the following day, he wrote simply to entreat her pardon. When the servant brought the note, she ordered him into the room. Then, taking the note from the man and unopened, consigning it to the flame, she said with calm dignity, You have seen, my friend, what I have now done. Tell your master that every future note he shall think proper to trouble me with. I shall treat in the same manner. Sir Harry next, by the intercession of her friends, begged for a few moments in audience. She was resolute in her refusal. He declared his love was unalterable, condemned again and again his infamous offers and earnestly besought her through her aunt to accept his hand. To this she deigned to reply. What, sir, said she, is marriage a cloak for every failing, a cure for every wound? Is marriage to be the last resort of the libertine when every other means of seduction fails? Will the name of marriage make the husband virtuous, faithful and more honourable? Will it atone to the wife for all his faults? Your former proposals, Sir Harry, have not degraded me, but yourself. Now shall your present ones sink me down to the level with you. That love I own I once felt for you, you have changed to contempt. I now consider you in another light, and desire you will give up a pursuit as needless to you as ungrateless, ungrateful to me. Sir Harry, in despair, left the place. Conscious too late of the treasure he had thrown away, he cursed the depravity of manners which had deprived him of the most valuable gift any man can possess. A virtuous woman. Chapter 13. Epigraph. O oh, comfort-killing night, image of hell, dim register and notary of shame, black stage for tragedies and murders fell, vast sin-concealing chaos nurse of blame. Blind, muffled, bored, dark harbour of defame, grim cave of death, whispering conspirator, with close-tongued treason and the ravisher. Shakespeare's Tarquin and Lucretia. When the period arrived for Mrs. Sherville's departure to her friend in Italy, she set off accompanied by Smith. They soon arrived at the place mentioned and found a servant in expectation of her coming, with a letter from Mrs. Vassell excusing her husband's absence on account of a dangerous fever with which he had been suddenly attacked. Smith's gallantry would not permit the lady to depart with only a servant, and without any objection on the part of his fair traveller, he accompanied her to her friend's residence. When our friend left England, he thought proper for the convenience of travelling to assume a military appearance. He put a cockade in his hat, a smart sword by his side, and his cher ami dignified him with the title of captain. In cash, too, he was very well off, having scraped together for this expedition the arrears that were due to him from the bounty of his friends and from his studentship. Mrs. Sherville found her friend in weeds. Mrs. Vassell having bidden a final farewell, Mr. Vassell having bidden a final farewell to his life soon after the servant departed. His spouse had taken such good care and had so managed her simple husband that he had left everything in his power to the widowed dame. The ladies, thus left without a protector, our hero easily suffered his politeness again to take place of all other intentions, and with the grateful thanks of the widow and the demi-widow, he made one of the party to Florence. 
Here Mrs Vassell was to take possession of some valuable effects of her husband's and intended to return to England in the spring. At the gay city of Florence, Mrs Vassell met with some old English acquaintance who were not sorry to pay their court to a young and rich widow, nor was the other fair lady in the smallest degree neglected. In return for these civilities, the ladies seemed perfectly well pleased. Mrs Vassell was in the hopes to fix a young debauchee, heir to one of the first titles in the kingdom. And Mrs Sherville was flattered with her innate love of vanity, dissipation and extravagance, and was become most heartily sick of constancy. Smith soon perceived that his company was not absolutely necessary for the happiness or protection of the fair ones. His love, not ripened to esteem, was nipped in the bud, and withered so very fast there was no moisture left to supply food for jealousy to feed on. He therefore hinted to the ladies that his presence would soon be wanted in England, and that he should leave them under their present good protection. Jealousy is defined by an excellent anatomist of the human mind to be more self-love than love of the object. Smith, in this instance, proved it, for his present civilities to Mrs. Sherbel were solely occasioned by his politeness and good nature. But self-love was totally out of the question, as he no longer felt the least inclination to remain with her, nor did he promote his own pleasure and gratify himself by staying at Florence. It is no wonder, then, that he perceived the attention that was paid her with indifference, and was glad to return to England. In his way back, our hero stayed at Turin. The dissipated life he had given himself up to had corrupted his morals and debased the genuine purity of his heart. He felt little inclination at present for the company of the fair sex, yet the insinuating glance of a fair Italian as he walked along the grand parade in the close of evening drew his attention in a moment. The lady was walking with an elderly female person, a servant boy following. As Smith spoke the Italian language but imperfectly, he addressed her in French, and he soon found she was a native of that country. His suit met with no other checks than what were intended as incitements, and she soon informed him that she lived with an Italian nobleman at an old family mansion without the town. To our hero's warm professions of love, she at last agreed that the elderly female person by whom she was attended should meet him an hour hence in the street of the Holy Cross and conduct him to her house. She objected to her hero's accompanying her, as it was not yet dark, and she was so well known in the neighbourhood that were she to admit a stranger in the absence of the Count, who was at present gone to the country seat, he would certainly hear of it at his return. Besides, she wished none of her servants to know of his visit but the old woman before mentioned. To these persuasive reasons, not that he believed a word of them, our hero assented. At the time appointed, he was met by the old woman in the street of the Holy Cross, and was by her conducted to a large house in the suburbs of the town. He entered by a lofty gateway into an old ruinous court, the high walls of which entirely enclosed the house. A small lamp which hung over the door gave him a faint view of the premises, where, as the building appeared very ancient and decayed, he supposed that it had originally been a monastery. When Smith had first formed the assignation, he believed the lady to be a common courtesan, who had made up a tale to enhance, enhance the price of her favours. But he began now to believe the story to be true, and his vanity not a little flattered him in having made so easy a conquest. The old woman brought him silently into the house, showed him into a large room, and informed him the lady would soon wait upon him. Smith looked around the apartment. All was dreary. The walls were high. One side was covered with tapestry, on which was wretchedly depicted the judgment of Solomon. On the other, two or three large pictures were hanging, framed, but old and tasteless. At the bottom of the room was a sofa, with an extensive canopy over it. The furniture was shabby, but had more the appearance of being bruised and broken than worn out by time. Smith's vanity was somewhat damped. He felt himself very uneasy. He began to repent his coming and heartily wished that he were again out of the place. With these thoughts little attuned for love, he threw himself upon the sofa and took out of his pocket a small petrarch which he had lately bought. His distempered mind was by no means in unison with the glowing fancies of the poet. In vain he tried to fix his attention, in vain he laboured to feel and to participate in the warm raptures of this author. Hardly had he read a moment, his imagination confused and bewildered, before something wet seemed to drop upon his book. With indifference, he looked up to see from whence it came, when a spectacle struck his eye that riveted him to the spot. The harrowing sight for a moment suspended the rest of his senses. He perceived a wretched object of a murdered man, 
with his throat divided, hanging over the canopy. Dying, he had been hastily thrown on the top, and the agonies of death had writhed him to the front. The blood, dark and clotted, yet oozed from the yawning wound, and slowly trickled upon the deep-stained floor, while the features, distorted with pain and smeared with gore, formed a hideous contrast to the black, dishevelled locks and pallid countenance of death. Smith started up. A cold chill froze the whole mass of his blood. He snatched his eyes from the sight, clapped his hand upon his sword, and rushed into the middle of the room. A confusion of gloomy ideas crowded upon his mind. With unknown fears, he looked around him. The figures in the old tapestry caught his attention. The executioner with the child extended, and the deadly weapon in his hand seemed to look sternly at him. Unusual horror pierced his soul. Instinctively, he shuddered. In a moment, his resolution returned, and he walked towards the figures. Again, he examined the countenance, but like the rest... The eyes now appeared dim and unmeaning. He drew his sword and drove it through the spot. It met with no obstacle from the wall, but pierced up to the hilt. Certain of the nature of the house he was in, and more particularly of that room, our hero proceeded, with his sword still drawn, towards the door of the apartment. The door was fast. Desperate, he seized upon a chair and lifted it on high to throw it against the door, when a sudden noise from behind him made him hastily turn round. In lifting up the chair, it had struck against one of the old pictures, which fell to the ground, and Smith perceived it had been placed as a covering to a concealed aperture in the wall. Cautiously, he put down the chair, and stepping through, found himself in another room, the door of which was open. All was dark around, save the glimmering light that came from the apartment he had quitted. He paused with careful steps, and he passed with careful steps into a long gallery. He heard voices at the farther end. He approached towards it and listened. A voice, like a man, said in Italian, He's a stout-looking fellow, had a sword, I saw, by his side. We had better wait till Sangri or the rest come, for Meta ought not to have gone out. She should have stayed and amused him for half an hour. Well, there was no need of that, said another, whose voice told him it was the old woman, for Meta is hunting down other game. It is safe enough. I defy him to get out. The moment a loud rapping at the gate stopped the conversation, and Smith, irresolute, undetermined how to act, was retreating to the dark room, when he perceived another door open. He firmly grasped his sword, determined to fight for his life, though with little hopes of escaping. A young female came out with a candle in her hand. Ragged and wretched was her appearance, her locks uncombed, her countenance pale and emaciated. She looked fearfully about, and perceiving our hero at the entrance of the room, she ran nimbly forward and holding her finger to her lips, in token of silence, motioned to him to retire into a room adjoining to her own. She followed, and instantly fastened the door with a large bolt. "'Have you courage,' said she, in broken Italian, "'to try and save me and yourself?' "'Yes, willingly,' said Smith, in English, struck by the sudden question. "'Oh,' said the other hastily, in the same language, "'my countrymen, too, no time is to be lost.' This closet is full of arms. By any means, break it open. Smith, animated, violently struck the panel with his foot and in a few seconds shattered it to pieces. Daggers, swords and pistols were hung around. He seized on a brace of pistols and found they were loaded. In the meantime, the door of this apartment was violently assaulted and they found the gang was returned. At first, indeed, the voice of his deceitful charmer had desired him in a gentle whisper to open. But hearing two persons in the room, she cried out, that English devil has betrayed us. And immediately the men who were in waiting at the door began to force it open. Smith, perceiving more pistols in the closet, desired his companion to hold a brace ready, and firing one of those in his hand straight through the door, immediately someone on the other side fell, and at the next instant the door burst open. The woman screamed and ran off. A man with a blunderbuss tumbled headlong into the room, and another stooped over him to pick it up. Our hero was at the farther end of the apartment. He lost not a moment. He fired his second pistol, and the man who was stooping fell upon his companion. Smith turned round, snatched a pistol from his fair second, and as he fired a third, the rest of the gang ran hastily down the gallery. Our hero now came up to the two men who were extended on the ground. They lay as dead, but his instructress earnestly besought him before he left the room to tie their hands behind them, and she ran back to the closet to fetch some cord for that purpose. As Smith was about to take hold on the first, the wretch suddenly turned round and was in the act of drawing his dagger, had not the youth felled him with his fist. His female assistant came up with the cord and Smith fastened him securely. The other he found 
was shot in the body, but he cautiously seized him, or wounded as he was, he was still able and willing to have attempted the same thing. Smith, taking the blunderbuss, inquired how many more men she had reason to suppose were in the house. He was informed the gang consisted of five and the boy, but that she was certain neither of the others would venture to attack him openly. They proceeded into the passage, Smith bearing the blunderbuss and his companions and pistols. They had not proceeded far when the door at the farther end of the gallery opened, and Flametta, the traitoress, herself came quietly forward. She began by desiring our hero to forbear all further hostility, swore in the most sacred and solemn terms that he should be safe and have the keys to conduct them both out of the place. Earnestly, too, she entreated him to let them succour their wounded friends. As she was speaking, she gradually walked towards him and was, in a few, was within a few paces of him when his countrywoman suddenly springing forward seized on the arms of Flametta. One hand was at the moment in her breast and had grasped a dagger at his attendant so seasonab seasonably interposed. What would have been the event of the struggle between the females is uncertain, but Smith soon wrenched the murderous weapon from Flametta's hand and with his handkerchief tied them tight behind her. Fellows had begun to show themselves from the adjoining room, but seeing the issue, again fastened the door. Smith took his prisoner into the room where the two other remained, and fastened her to a chair. He next consulted with his able assistant of the best means to escape from the place. The house was so full of doors, closets, and secret places, she informed him, that it would be with the utmost danger they could venture forth that night. But in the morning he might hope for better success. They remained, therefore, upon guard all that night in the same room. Smith, very humanely, with his countrywoman's assistance, staunched the blood which flowed from the wounds of the two villains, and then inquired of the English girl, who was yet but young, how she came into that situation. Her tale was short. From the early neglects of her parents and a bad education, she had imbibed but weak notion of religion and morality, and her beauty only helped to hasten her ruin. She was easily seduced from the paths of virtue, and soon became an inhabitant of a common bagnio in London. Here she met with an Italian who often came to the house, and offered to take her away and marry her if she would accompany him to his native country. She had accepted his offer about a year ago. Too soon she perceived the diabolical purpose for which she was intended, and unable to prevent it, she was used as a decoy to seduce the unwary libertine to the slaughter. When she first came, not being able to speak a word of the language, she had often been compelled to be the innocent cause of the destruction of many. She had been here about three months. Her infamous husband had perished a few weeks before in a broil in the streets, but the society still forced her to remain among them. Whenever she went out, the old woman came, and the most resolute of the gang as, in a, servant, as a servant attended her. She was never permitted to speak to anyone, but that as soon as her appearance had been noticed by anyone, she was taken home and an assignation made by the old woman in her name. She further informed our hero that about three weeks ago she had tried to caution a young man they were about to ensnare, and had happily succeeded, but that she was instantly hurried away, had been severely beaten and otherwise ill-used, that she was determined from the day she came here to attempt to escape the first opportunity that offered, and save some hapless youth. This she was in hopes would now succeed if they patiently waited for the daylight. For I'd rather perish, said she, than live any longer in this dreadful place, which I have never been out of from the day I saved the stranger's life, assuring him as he passed me a handkerchief steeped in blood. Chapter 14. Epigraph. Ah, cruel love, thou bane of every joy, whose pains or sweets alike our peace destroy, still equal woes from thee mankind endure, fateful thy wounds, and fatal is the cure. Tasso's Jerusalem. When the morning came and the sun gave its full light, Smith, well armed with his fair companion, cautiously proceeded down the stairs. With no little joy, they perceived all the doors open and the house deserted. As soon as he had gained the town, he went before a magistrate and related the particulars of the evening, which his female partner corroborated. The magistrate sent the officers of justice, who found sufficient proof to satisfy them of the dreadful proceedings of the inhabitants of the place. The murdered body was owned, the two men and the women were committed to prison, and soon after publicly executed. The English girl was permitted by the magistrate to go where she pleased. Accordingly, Smith offered to see her safe to England, and endeavoured to provide her with some honest livelihood there. 
She was tall and pleasing in her person and lively in her manners, but so emaciated by the cruelty she had experienced in her confinement that it was thought necessary for her to remain a few days to recover her strength before she proceeded on her journey. In the course of conversation, our hero soon found that the original name of his fair companion was Smith. It is my own name, replied he. I was born in Wiltshire. I was born in Wiltshire, continued the lady. My parents once kept a respectable public house on the London Road. Alas, would they had still continued in the parish of Pitford. P Pitford was my parish, replied our hero warmly. Surely you must have heard of my... He could not say mother, but added with a sigh, a, a poor woman who died in childbirth in the house. Alas, sir, she was the innocent cause of my wretched education and ruin. Good God, how? Indeed, she was not so poor as you may suppose. Not so poor? Money and valuables to a very large amount my parents found upon a person, tempted by the prize, they secreted it and imposed upon the parish officers. I was too young to know the particulars. Buoyed up with what they thought inexhaustible wealth, they left the place and neglected every kind of business. My father associated with gamblers of all descriptions and frequented the different races. My mother took to drinking. I was neglected. My great riches fled away. Ruined remained my only portion. What has become of my father I know not. My mother, I've reason to suppose, is no more. They apprenticed me to a wretch as unprincipled as themselves, and I became the victim of I've never seen either of them since. What? replied Smith. Was everything spent? Every trinket, every trifle made away with? Now, this little ivory crucifix, which I now wear around my, my neck, I believe, is the only thing left. This would have been long ago disposed of, and I had never worn it, but it is of no value. To me, it would be of the greatest value, for no, I am the child of the unhappy mother that owned it. The lady, in her turn, testified her surprise and insisted on our hero's accepting the ivory crucifix. This he willingly complied with and presented his companion with the gold one in its stead. Smith felt himself happy in this gaining, in thus gaining some little token of his mother, and did not lessen his joy to find that she was not of so low a station as he had originally supposed. He wished to gain some clue with the parents of the young woman, but she could give him no intelligence whatsoever. A few days' rest wonderfully restored the bloom to the fair damsel's cheeks, and reanimated her whole frame. They began to prepare for their journey to England, when a circumstance happened that removed the temptation from our hero and obliged him to take the voyage alone. The day before they were to depart, his fair companion saw from the window of the inn the Italian gentleman whose life she had saved. She could not resist the temptation of again waving her now spotless handkerchief. He obeyed the signal and knew her immediately. She thought proper to speak to him, and he explained her, and explained her conduct. He was a nobleman of distinction, and out of gratitude promised to provide for her in any means she thought proper the same time making her an offer of an elegant establishment with him, and a suitable provision in case of his death. Accustomed to a life of low debauchery, this seemed even virtue to it. Besides, she liked the man, and every other settlement was uncertain. A hero had as yet resisted every tender of the love kind. She therefore made no scruple to tell him she should remain in Italy, under the protection of the Count de Florenni. The Count behaved as honourable as any man could in affairs of that kind, and Smith took his leave of them and returned to England. The scenes he had lately witnessed made a great impression upon his mind. He had seen vice in her native colours, unadorned with those trappings with which he had been accustomed to behold her. He now clearly perceived that virtue was something more than a name, and that a series of vices naturally follow one another and join together, as one link of a chain does to the other. Youth and nature were some little excuse for his first attachment to Mrs. Cherville, but a love of idleness and dissipation had continued him when passion was gone in this shameful waste of his time, his health, and his property. Thus had the life of our hero degenerated downwards to the regular standard of common debauchery, and so depraved was he become that he had no sooner left Mrs. Sherville than he shamefully yielded to the temptation of the first showy troll that offered. The progress of vice is like the snowball from the Alpine mountains. Though small and slow in its onset, rapidly it increases in its speed and size, and soon overwhelms the helpless traveller that first beheld it with indifference. Nearly had our hero here fallen the victim of his folly, and had he miserably perished by the hands of the bravos in a common brothel, 
In his dying moments, he must have confessed that a needless, willful debauchery had hastened his ruin. In his voyage to England, he had time to reflect on his past misconduct, and many a good resolution did he form, many a virtuous and regular scheme, plan, to steer his future life. As the basis of all, he determined by every supplication, by two contrition, and by a steady perseverance in virtue, to recover the affections of his adored Miss Modley. Next, to prosecute his studies, which he had long so grossly neglected, and learn to be more humble to his superiors. In short, he resolved, after the example of his friend Freeman, to endeavour to conquer his passions, and be like him the declared enemy of vice and friend of virtue in every form. With these good intentions, he arrived at his native country, and lost no time in hastening to Oxford. His Italian expedition had delayed him some months longer than he proposed, but he was fixed in his own mind that this should be the last time of his playing the truant. In the meanwhile, a scene had passed at Oxford of which our hero had very little idea. By the neglect of Stu proper attendance, he had forfeited his studentship, which had regularly been declared vacant, his name erased from the books, and another elected in his room. In vain had his friend Lord Edward Caffison and his own tutor repeatedly written to him and sent letters, both to Sir Harry Valances in town and Mr Freeman's in Wales. Neither Mr Freeman nor Sir Harry knew where to find him. The former could give no account and the latter could only inform him that he had set off to France, and he believed was gone into Italy. When Smith returned to the university and found his name had been erased from the books, he may have been said for the first time to have really felt the folly of his former conduct. He found himself all at once in a situation he thought he had escaped. He perceived that he must in some degree be dependent, and he had too well imbibed the high notions of Mr Freeman on that subject to be easy in his own mind. The airy palace of happiness which his warm hopes had imagined was all blown down again, and he had again to begin the fabric. But how was he to provide for himself? Where was he to apply for that purpose? Should he enter at another college and live upon the means remaining from the benevolence of his friends? He could not humble his spirit to an inferior situation with an inferior income, and he saw a host of duns ready to assail him the moment he was settled in such a state. While his mind thus wavered, totally irresolute how to act, his more particular acquaintance, Sir Harry Valence and Lord Edward, the first of whom he had written to the moment he came to England, and who came to Oxford for the purpose of meeting him, called upon him. He mentioned what had happened and confessed his conduct had been so imprudent he did not like to apply to Mr Freeman, not even for his advice. <clears throat> he is so conscious, constantly cautioned me, Smith, against the very rock on which I've split. They will have every reason to think me a most ungrateful and debauched fellow. <clears throat> what think you of the army? said Sir Harry. If I had the means of purchasing into it, if I had the means of purchasing into it, replied the other, I, I would not hesitate a moment. Well, you know, Smith, continued Sir Harry, how my pecuniary affairs are involved. In other matters, I played the fool ten times worse than yourselves, but I can certainly get you an insignity or cornetcy directly if you choose. For this damn business, said Lord Edward Ormley, I hope we shall soon get over, but for the present I have a hundred pounds I can easily spare, and I insist as an old friend that you take it. Smith absolutely refused, without immediately answering to Sir Harry, and Lord Edward replied, But upon my soul, Smith, I shall think you a damn proud fellow if you will not take it. Sir Harry, I know by his connections, can get you a cordancy, and this will at least help to set you a-going. Now, don't refuse me, Smith. I always considered you as a friend, and thought you looked upon me in the same light. But if we are only common acquaintance, you are in the right not to receive any favour from me. The devil himself may take the hundred pounds. Smith, who knew the honest warmth of his friend, no longer refused, and accepted also the kind offer of Sir Harry. The knowledge that I've got two such good friends, said our hero, makes me less regret this unpleasant business, as it has proved them to be such. And that excellent man, Mr Freeman, whom I confess I was rather afraid to write to before, will... When I have told him the particulars, see that I am not altogether so unworthy as he might otherwise suppose. Upon my word, Smith, said Lord Edward, whose opinion of Mr. Freeman exceeded all bounds. He is the best fellow breathing. There is a heart like a lion, his soul is compassionate as a child. I was most truly wish he had been my father. Nay, nay, said his lordship, recollecting himself. Not a word to say against my father. Ever since he has known Mr. Freeman, he has always behaved as he should do. Somehow or other, Freeman. Sets us all to rights. The tears stood in our hero's eyes as he heard this artless tribute of Lord Edward's to his old friend's praise. 
Mr. Freeman was considered by Smith as so superior a being to the general race that he feared, in truth unreasonably, to own his faults to him without some alleviation. So Harry told Smith, as he had given up the gown, he would immediately write about the cornetcy. Well, and I have no doubt, in a few days, we shall hear from the great man. The obligations, continues Sir Harry, as Smith was about to reply, is very little, I assure you. At the end of a war that has been so fatal to our soldiers, there are very few that are inclined to encounter the horrors of a Western climate. In these new raised regiments, Smith, I fear the West Indies will be your destination. <clears throat> of that I will, willingly, replied he, stand my chance. I'm greatly obliged to your friendship, and in the present prospect and state of my affairs, it is my wish to leave England, and to enter into some active scene for a few years. No great matter where. As Smith spoke the last sentence, he had the idea of his still-beloved Eliza in his mind, and the very little hopes that were left of her ever being his. Dissipation and the confusion of his thoughts had, for a time, indeed discarded her, but the remembrance returned with new vigour when he experienced a calm. Notwithstanding her absolute refusal and studied indifference, she was as dear to him as ever. He blamed himself alone for the positive dismissal, and thought he had been discarded with no expectation of her future favour. He vainly considered that her not having yet given her hand to another was a favourable hope she might still be his. So the poor victim, worn down with diseases, already half expired, as his soul hovers for its fight, swallows the deceitful drought, draught, and vainly fancies he may yet live. O oh, hope, art thou so pleasing as poets and moralists say? I fear thou art often but a frail bark that carries the fated mariner further into the seas, and as thou fallest to pieces in the deep, he sinks to the bottom for ever. Our hapless hero find, found thy weakness, Hadst thou sooner deserted him, he might have reached the shore in safety, but borne into the depths, I'd stim at last, and left him at the mercy of the all destructive waves. Our hero prepared to go to town about his cornetcy, when a circumstance happened that delayed him for a time and showed his character in a new light. A little after Sir Harry had first paid his addresses to Miss Maitland, among many other suitors, was the son of a country gentleman who was an intimate acquaintance of her father's. This young man was only twenty, a lieutenant in the navy, and to all the openness that characterises a sailor, added an excellent mind, well stored with modern learning, and rich with every virtue that dignifies the human heart. Miss Maitland, then engaged to Sir Harry, candidly told him so, and disappointed in the hopes of the first passion he had conceived, he went to sea again immediately. Returning home soon after Mr Maitland's death, and understanding the match was off with Sir Harry, he soon found Miss Maitland's residence, and with all his former possessions, of regard, professions of regard, once more offered himself. Miss Maitland was much affected at the nobleness of his conduct, but thought proper to refuse him, assuring him at the same time she was proud of his friendship, and that his disinterested conduct would be ever engraven on her heart. Sir Harry, when he heard of Clarendon's offer, had no doubt from his own knowledge of the female character that pique alone would induce her to accept him, and Captain Clarendon, for he was lately made a master and commander, Suppose that a lurking affection for the baronet prevented his wishes. It is natural to conclude that these two gentlemen did not regard each other in every favourable light, and like the flint and steel, they only waited for a meeting to strike fire. Miss Maitland had very much feared it, from some expressions unintentionally dropped from the open-hearted sailor, and she prevailed upon him to promise that he would not purposely insult and notice Sir Harry. Clarendon had a younger brother, at Oxford, and at this time unluckily called upon him. Captain Clarendon and Sir Harry had been slightly acquainted. Sir Harry passed by Darlington's coffee house as the captain and Lord Edward, who was an old schoolfellow, were lounging out of the window. Clarendon, struck on the, on the sudden by the appearance of his hated rival, could not help exclaiming, Oh, there's that damn baronet! Sir Harry turned his head round, saw him, and walked into the coffee room. Coffee room. Such expression, Captain Clarendon, meant for me. Well, it's not intended for your hearing, Sir Harry, turning from him. Well, that is no answer, sir. I thought you beneath a subterfuge. A subterfuge? Yes, when you utter language, you're ashamed to avow. <laughs> ashamed? retorted the captain, turning round. In truth, I'm ashamed of you and your conduct. No, you take a great liberty in troubling yourself with me or my affairs. I wish to forget there's such a being in existence. <sighs> you mean to affront me, Captain Clarendon? Exactly, Sir Harry, as you choose to take it. 
I cannot be blind in so palpable an affair. This is too public a place for any further discussion. We shall hear from me again this evening. I'm ready in a moment at such a call. As soon as Sir Harry left the coffee house, he called on Smith, told him of his intended affair with the captain, and begged him to accompany him to the field. Smith found his friend determined, and did not refuse the important office, and as Sir Harry assured him their mutual dislike originated from no trifling cause, he told him it could not possibly be adjusted on amicable terms. He next desired Smith to call upon Captain Clarendon and settle the place of their meeting any time the following week, and at a proper distance from Oxford. Our hero had been often in company with Captain Clarendon, and was extremely sorry to hear of the quarrel. He knew the particulars of Sir Harry's addresses to Miss Maitland, and he was informed that Clarendon was not an accepted lover. He at once saw the strong cause of the mutual enmity and the difficulty of conciliating the parties. Sir Harry considered Clarendon as a man who intruded on his pretensions, and who was likely to take the advantage of his breach with his fair mistress to introduce himself as success. He as such looked upon him with the keen eyes of distrust and jealousy, and where these evils are, revenge is not far distant. The late insult, therefore, roused that passion which was before dormant, and he had no difficulty to make himself believe, what every man who is going to fight endeavours to do, that he was the injured person. Clarendon, on the other hand, saw in Sir Harry not only a successful rival who had gained the affections of his mistress, but one who had basely betrayed that affection and insulted her with dishonourable offers. While Captain Clarendon loved Miss Maitland with all the ardour of the most enamoured adorer, his esteem and respect were as pure as for a beloved sister. He therefore viewed the conduct of Sir Harry in the most hateful light, suspicious also that the remains of her former attachment for so undeserving an object was the cause of her late refusal of himself, and that Sir Harry might still at some future period succeed, he could not fail being also jealous. He thought therefore a quarrel with such a man was no more than what common justice demanded, and that the protection of the innocent required it of him. The wish of Miss Maitland, which he believed the remains of her former love, had alone prevented his calling Sir Harry out the moment he heard the circumstance. But chance had now befriended him, and Sir Harry had met him halfway. That such was their opinion of each other, Smith clearly saw. The beginning of the following week was fixed upon for their meeting. Each of the gentlemen settled their temporary affairs, and every preparation seemed to determine that one or the other must fall. Chapter 15 Too many gallant youths have bled, too much of British blood been shed by Britain's sword and honour's frantic laws. Use that might else have nobly dared more glorious wounds and dangers shared than Britain's just defence and virtue's injured cause. On the day appointed, Sir Harry Valance and Captain Clarendon met. Smith and Lord Edward attended a second with the eminent surgeon. The attempts of their mutual friends at a reconciliation had been ineffectual, and a more melancholy group cannot possibly be conceived. When they came upon the ground, the gentleman of the faculty again took upon himself the office of mediator, but each he found considered himself as the injured person and his enemy as the aggressor. The ground was at last measured, the pistols were loaded, and it was agreed they should both fire at the same time. Lord Edward, with a sorrowful countenance, gave the pistol to Clarendon, and Smith, not less affected, to Sir Harry. The surgeon was to give a signal for them to raise their pistols and to fire. As they stood thus opposed to one another, some thoughts of a hereafter, some unpleasant twangs of conscience, must naturally strike to the most pure and undaunted heart. In the impetuous animation of a battle, it is not always so. The noise and the confusion, the glory, the hope, the emulation and example will oftentimes drown every symptom of fear. But cool and deliberate manslaughter is far, very far different. While the combatants thus stood opposed to each other, Smith motioning to the surgeon to retire to a little distance as a last attempt thus spake, before you lift up your hands to do what can never be recalled, let me once more, as a friend to both, attempt a reconciliation. I've gone too far to draw back now, said one of the gentlemen, and the other, both speaking impatiently and at the same time. I cannot see the use of delaying. Well, pardon me, continue here. This is a duty I owe, not only to you, but to my friend Lord Edward, that respectable gentleman pointing to the surgeon, and to myself. I beg your attention for a few moments. I speak not in the hated name of a second, but in that of a mutual friend. 
As far as the affair is yet proceeded, you cannot help in some degree respecting each other for cool, determined courage, for fair, open and honourable dealings. How unlike the deliberate duelist with his hair trigger, studied attitude and first fire. You must think of each other far better, and I hope, I believe, that this dreadful business may be concluded without the destruction of either of the principles, and the everlasting regret of the survivor and ourselves. Everything has already taken place between you except the act of blood itself that is incumbent on men of the nicest honour. The act itself cannot increase the credit of either, and no one can doubt for a moment your mutual courage and determined will to resent an insult, as becomes the custom of this country. You are not exhibiting yourselves here to become the heroes of a newspaper, and the conversation that is about to take place between us is not intended to be pamphleted into the world. Your conduct out on this field shall be the only apology for your behaviour in it. Give me leave, then, to ask you both a few questions, that at least you may no longer have an unjust cause of suspicion against each other, and promise to give me a direct answer. To this the gentlemen could not refuse their assent. Will any concession and reparation, said Smith, addressing himself to each of them separate, satisfy you without the blood of your enemy? They both strongly replied in the affirmative. Well, Sir Harry, continued our hero, have you not made the most full apology and every reparation in your power to Miss Maitland for your former imprudent offers? Indeed, Mr. Smith, replied Sir Harry, I cannot answer that question. <laughs> Sir Harry, you have promised me, both of you, this is all before friends. Well then, I have. Can you, or do you, wish to defend that former conduct? What does your question tend, replied Sir Harry. Sir Harry, said Lord Edward, you have promised to answer. Remember, you answer but to your own heart. Whatever is uttered here goes no further without general consent. Sir Harry bowed. I neither can nor wish to defend my infamous offers to Miss Maitland. Then turning to Captain Clarendon, Smith said, is there anything more as an apology you could possibly have required of Sir Harry Valance, Captain Clarendon? No, certainly not. Was you not ignorant before that Sir Harry had made so full a reparation? I was. And if you had known his complete detestation of his own conduct before you met him at Oxford, would you have spoke so contemptuously of him? No, I acted under a mistake which I freely own. Wow. Give me leave to ask you another question, Captain Clarendon. Has Miss Maitland at all encouraged your addresses? Well, it is a strange question, but the other. Indeed, you cannot refuse to answer, said Edward. She has given me no hopes, said he. Sir Harry, continued our hero, has not Miss Maitland absolutely refused the renewal of your acquaintance, even on the most honourable terms? The baronet replied rather indignantly. Yes. Then speaking to Captain Clarendon, our hero proceeded. Was not the insult which was offered Miss Maitland the real cause that occasioned you to seek this meeting? It was. Has not Sir Harry made sufficient atonement? He has. And you are satisfied? I am. Sir Harry. You have heard Captain Clarendon is satisfied. You have also heard his apology for the words that offended you, that it was through a mistake. Do you admit it? Does Captain allow and wish it to be an apology? Captain Clarendon answered. Yes, he does. Sir Harry, are you satisfied? I am. I trust then, you hear, I hear that there can be no necessity for your proceeding further in this business. Does any cause of offence remain to you, Sir Harry? He answered in the negative, and the same question being put to Captain Clarendon, he returned the same answer and instantly fired his pistol in the air. Sir Harry followed his example, and thus, by the steady perseverance of our hero, was their inveterate hatred allayed, their contending passions abated, without the bloodshed of either. The combatants had been addressed when they least expected it, and could not help allowing the reasonableness of Smith's arguments. But though their quarrel was at an end, they had no such inclination for one another's companies as to commence great friends all at once. Jealousy could not fail rankling in both their hearts, though no cause remained for contention. The gentlemen all shook hands and parted on the ground. 
Smith accompanied Sir Harry to town and Lord Edward the captain to Portsmouth where his ship was. The character of Smith from his late conduct rose higher in the estimation of both his friends and they were more anxious for his interest than ever. Sir Harry was become much altered. His behaviour to Miss Maitland and the loss of her affections preyed upon his spirits and he despaired of ever regaining her favour. Smith soon received a cornetcy in a new raised regiment, and had notice given him that the regiment would most probably be sent abroad in a few months, as soon as they were instructed in their exercise. To hasten the business as much as possible, he was, he was ordered immediately to K. Our youth was, at present, at Sir Harry's. The morning before he left London to join his regiment, Sir Harry, with a more animated countenance than he had worn for some time, surprised Smith by saying, I'm going to the East Indies. <laughs> Indeed? When? very soon next week have you entered the army no i go as a volunteer under lord c oh this is a sudden determination sir harry i've long proposed to leave england i dined yesterday you know in company with his lordship his expedition was talked about and i wished i was going with him and without waiting for a reply offered me my services as a volunteer he was at first surprised and doubted my determination, but the moment he was assured with the polite attention of a man and a soldier, he accepted my offer. I shall see him again this morning. You are not then, said Smith, in any regiment? Not at present. I'm not very partial to a military life, but the war still spreading prevents private travelling, and surely I cannot better employ the time absent from my native country than in its defence. Were I to remain in town, Smith, I should soon become a miserable victim to the vices of fascinating dissipation. I have already attempted crimes my natural feelings recoil at, and my real principles detest. I can only rejoice that the chief was not accomplished. Miss Maitland, let me think her guardian angel, is safe. Another poor girl, a daughter of a country shopkeeper, and happily apprenticed at a bait milliner's, has been ruined by me. I left her, on hearing that Miss Maitland's father was no more, the agitation of my mind neglected to send her any remittance. When I returned to town with you, I went to her lodging, not doubting that she was still there. She was gone, had been stripped of her small property for the debt of the lodging, and almost in the hour of labour turned to the street by the infamous woman of the house. You can tell how restless I have been ever since I came to town, day after day, unceasingly I sought her. Chance at last discovered her to me as a beggar with her poor little boy. I will not relate the misery that my neglect of her occasioned. The charity of one, almost as poor as herself, afforded her a hovel in which she was delivered of her burden. The same charity has given her the common necessities of life for herself and her infant, and had pointed to her the resource of begging to prevent a greater evil. Would you have believed it, Smith, that a poor old woman, who dragged on a precarious existence by the pickings of the street, could have afforded this assistance to another fellow creature, even attempted charity to others? blush, grandeur, pomp and avarice, it was so. I've made what reparation I could for poor Fanny. She's good, and she's gone as a widow, to live in the country near her friends, and I've settled a hundred pounds a year on herself and child. I've also given the friendly old woman an annuity of twenty pounds and advanced the first quarter. Do you think I have done sufficient? I think, replied Smith, you've acted very right. Much better than settling a large sum and more likely to produce happiness. Had this unhappy young creature perished by my neglect, continued Sir Harry, I never could have been happy. I should have always considered myself a, a murderer. The manners of the world cannot so deceive me as to make me appear to myself innocent when I feel I am guilty. My dear friend, said our hero, my principles fully accord with your own. Everyone who does an injury to another is nevertheless as complete a villain, whether the laws reach him or not and I firmly believe that the man who seduces an unhappy female and leaves her a victim to vice and misery is not less guilty than if he had finished the cruel deed by stabbing her to the heart. Had he committed the last, he might have hurt his own feelings more, but he had probably spared hers. He had prevented the progress of immorality. He had severed the chain of vice. The destruction of a fellow creature may be perpetrated without the immediate conclusion of the life, and I declare, Sir Harry, I should, I think, feel less remorse, bad and dreadful as the supposition is, in having rashly slain a fellow creature, and I should in being conscious of a cool and determined plot that ended in her ruin. A poor young woman, seduced from her original station in life, may glitter and dazzle for a while. The evil that afterwards follows the original author is willing to transfer to others. 
and when the unhappy girl is at last by regular gradation by the natural consequence of her first introduction to vice hurried to the gulf of worldly misery we can calmly blame her own folly and imprudence yes he may blame her and excuse himself he is at present his own judge but let him not even think of a future tribunal as the very thought should destroy the few short moments that yet remain to him of his delusion before the stern avenger of the helpless and innocent shall call him to account. The destruction of this young woman, I trust, I have prevented in time, said Sir Harry. Oh, Smith, what a dangerous preeminence is birth and fortune. We are deceived from our cradle and never hear a truth that is pleasing. My education has been my bane. This fascinating city has completed the delusion. I am determined to tear myself from it, and if ever my friend we meet again in my native country, you shall find I am not so deficient in what, the shame I confess, I have ever neglected, the pure principles of virtue, morality, and religion. With these good sentiments and resolutions, the friends parted, and Smith, the same day, joined his regiment at Kay. As the first act of contrition, our hero wrote a very long and excellent letter to Mr. Freeman. He fully and clearly told his conduct and the deserved though ungrateful consequences which had followed. He declared that the chief thing that had prevented his writing was the fear of encroaching too far on those friends whose liberality he had made so ill a use of. He confessed also to Mr. Freeman that his deaths, both at Oxford and in London, far exceeded his present means of paying, but that he was getting a full statement of them before he left England, and he hoped by economy and by the utmost care and attention in his affairs to be able to settle everything by the time that he returned. Such were the heads of his letter, and with a determination to put his good resolutions in practice, he remained fixed at his quarters and totally employed himself in attending to his military duty. Mr. Freeman immediately answered his letter in the most kind and friendly manner. He informed him that his friend, Major Gray, was married, but did not yet talk of returning to England. The rest of the letter was of no material consequence to this history, though highly gratifying to our hero. Smith received many invitations from his London acquaintance, but he resisted the temptation, and for the first two months he did not leave the vicinity of the regiment or sleep from his quarters one night. By such regular discipline he perfected himself in the art militant, and had been of such use in getting the common men fit for service that a, that a lieutenancy which was vacant was offered him on very advantageous terms. He was to pay a small sum annually from his pay till he procured the principal that made the difference of his cornetcy. A hero joyfully accepted the offer, and as the captain of the troop had leave of absence to visit his friends at a distance before he went abroad, the command rested upon Smith. This early preferment redoubled the ardour of our hero, and so orderly were his men and under such regular good discipline that he received the thanks of all the inhabitants for his conduct. About this time a trifling circumstance happened which, as it had nothing to do with the general history of the youth, I shall admit at present, as it will be more properly mentioned in the description of a man with whom Harry, with whom Smith, soon after got acquainted. Sir so Harry Valence was now on his voyage to the East Indies, and Lord Edward Caffeyson was soon expected from Ireland, where he had been to visit some estates of the dukes in that kingdom. Chapter 16 It may be doubted, with good reason, whether there ever was in a nation a more abject, slavish, and bigoted generation than the tribes of Beau Esprit, at present so prevalent in this island. Their pretenions to be free livers, and no other than rakes have to be free thinkers, and savages to be free men. Number 234, The Spectator. In this station, Smith remained till his captain returned. He then asked for leave of abstinence and went to town for a week to prepare proper apparel and other necessaries before he went abroad. He also received a letter from Whiffle that Sims and himself were in town and wished much to see him. He found them at their former house, the New Hummums, and at dinner they introduced to him the new acquaintance mentioned in the last chapter, Mr. Marmaduke Pendragon. This gentleman was tall and rather large in his person, particularly a head so round that a turnip, well scraped and rouged, would be no bad emblem. His hair had been originally very light, but he had thought proper to commerce, commence crop, and as a crop is nothing without a black head of hair, it was dyed black. He had well rubbed the sides of his face with onions to get him a pair of whiskers. It had succeeded, but unhappily the whiskers came up a dingy yellow. As his eyebrows still retained their natural colour, his curly black head had more the appearance of his being covered with a wig. 
His plump, round countenance, too, appeared so fat and puerile that no stranger of any sensibility could look in his face without a smile. Marmaduke was one of the younger sons of a country gentleman of family and fortune in the north of England, and who had been for many parliaments a member for the county. The family was very large, eight daughters and six sons. As such, Marmaduke had reason to think himself handsomely provided for on the death of his father, with a fortune of £8,000, the portion of each of the younger children. His friends had placed him with an eminent attorney, but proud of his independence, he could bear no restraint or confinement, and before two years had passed, he contrived to get released from his articles. He next, therefore, took lodgings in the temple under pretense of studying the law as a barrister. The greatest misfortune that could have happened to Marmaduke was that in his younger years he showed more vivacity and pertness than generally fell to the lot of his other brothers and sisters. The family were never noticed for their wisdom, and they mistook the abilities of Marmaduke and cried him up as a miracle of sense. This young gentleman, upon the credit of his early knowledge, was always very tenacious of his own opinion, would never listen to any advice, and was, by this time, his 21st year, become a most curious compound of eccentricity and folly. He was what he himself called a violent asserter of the cause of freedom, in other words, a democrat upon the French scale. Without any settled principle or rule of action, he pretended to disbelieve everything, religious or moral, that did not suit his own turn. In short, what with the jumble of law terms, political cant, London phrases, pieces of oration heard at the spouting clubs and other public meetings, gleanings from the playhouse and extracts from the pamphlets of the day, his language was a complete mix of absurdity, impudence and folly. He had never read ten pages in any one book since he came from school, yet he was anxious for the character of a scholar, and without being able to speak on the same subject for two minutes, he oftentimes attempted the orator, especially among those he considered as his inferiors. At present, his eight thousand pounds were about half gone, and the hopeful youth was neither improved in law nor learning, more than when he first came from the attorneys. This genius Smith frequently met with Whiffle and Sims, and one evening he prevailed upon our hero to attend with him the lectures of a famous anti-Anglo politician. The rage of our hero was scarcely restrained as he heard the most illiberal invectives against the laws of his country, while the semblance of Roman or Greek jurisprudence concealed the lurking insinuation and was made use of as a cloak for the orator. After the lecture, another of the same stamp with the utmost judgment, taste and feeling read a few pages from a modern publication written in the form of a novel, but purposefully to condemn the civil and criminal laws of Great Britain. Marmaduke was wonderfully pleased with the last as being more suited to his comprehension, and as they returned to the tavern, eagerly asked Smith's opinion of the subject. He replied that the characters were unnatural, there were none such in common life, and that the circumstances recorded in the tale were not only improbable, but could never happen in the common course of things. Don't you know, said the other, that a great man in this country may at any time oppress his servants, tenants, servants, or dependents, and by dint of money and interest take away all hope of redress? No, replied Smith, I only know that men without good principles, whether rich or poor, may elude, pervert, and abuse the very best laws, and sometimes with impunity. But no man can directly or indirectly trample on another without being at all times liable to be punished. The thief may steal, the highwayman may rob and stand their chance of detection, in the same manner as the wicked wretch in power may injure his poor neighbour and run the risk of his revenge. I'll give you an instance, rejoined our youth, that came but the other day under my notice. I am quartered with my party not many miles from London. The captain was absent, and the command devolved upon me. As I was exercising the troop on a common near the high road, one of the soldier's horses, and the new one, violent and high-spirited, that from a hurt in his leg had not been rid for some days, hearing a huntsman's halloo, broke from the ranks, and regardless of every impediment, rushed towards the sound. The man, a very good rider, was some time before he could stop him, and in the interim he'd passed two ladies and their servants on the public road. The ladies were much frightened, but not the least accident happened. As the man returned by the ladies, he civilly took off his cap and then joined the ranks. The same evening, I received a message from Lady Upscott, one of the persons he'd passed to attend her at a place about eight miles from my quarters. The letter also contained violent invectives against the man. I answered her ladyship in the most civil manner that I could not possibly wait upon her, but I was extremely sorry she'd been frightened. I would inquire into the particulars of the case, and if the man had behaved in the least wrong, he should certainly be punished. Lady Upscott's husband, you know, is one of the first men in the kingdom, 
and as a minister, his power is as excessive as any subject's. Her ladyship was doubly enraged at my not attending her summons, and upon hearing the man was not punished, for I at once perceived from others he met on the road that he was free from any blame. She therefore so stated the business to my lord, so influenced his passions, that he applied to the war minister to have the man severely punished. I received an order to attend the minister, who intimated to me his lordship's pleasure. His lordship has also thought proper to write to me upon the subject. I replied to the war minister that if he thought proper to call a court martial, the affair might be publicly investigated but that I should do no such thing, as I could prove the man was totally innocent. In reply to his lordship's letter, I said that upon inquiry so far from punishing the man, I would in every respect protect him, and that if his lordship again made use of his undue influence in the business to the mutual prejudice of myself and the soldier, I would at once make the affair as public as possible and leave his lordship's character to answer for the consequences. Well, sir, so ended the business. I've not heard another word of the matter, and I'm well assured I never shall. Mr. Marmaduke was not satisfied. He never was when he began with a contrary opinion. He therefore contended till they had reached the tavern that servants and dependents were most shamefully neglected and oppressed by the English laws. Sims and Whiffle and some others met them at supper. The eccentricity of Marmaduke's character amused them very much, and as he freely drank his wine, he became still more ridiculous. Marmaduke, Marmaduke knew by sight most of the dashing characters about town. He could call every fashionable demirep by her name and made himself master of the Christian name of half the noblemen in London. All these he indiscriminately talked about, as he told some barefaced lie, plainly proved it was so in the very next sentence. Hmm, I dined in company with his grace of Castledown the other day. His grace? He's been aboard these two years. I mean his brother, Lord John, a fine young man, I knew him intimately. His grace has no brother? It has an uncle, Lord John, but he's so unfirm, he seldom goes from home. Well, never mind, I hate all your aristocrac aristocrac aristocratical party. I, I, I mean, uh, some of the family. Unluckily, me, Marmaduke, this is the most democratical family in the kingdom. So well informed is the promising youth, the advocate of liberty, the reformer of the religion and laws of his country. Soon afterwards, Marmaduke took it in his hands to abuse the Bible, and from a few pages he had read in a fashionable novel made sure of his mark. It's a very indecent and indelicate book, said he, unfit for the perusal of young and chaste minds. Well, believe, my dear friend, said Whiffle with a dry look, you know as much of the Bible as you do of any other book. Oh, now, Whiffle, said Marmaduke, you're always doubting my learning, but I can prove that the Bible is very indecent. Mr. Marmaduke, said Smith, do you love truth? Undoubtedly, truth is, truth is, Universally the language of the Bible, said Smith. And by the fidelity of translators, many indelicate expressions are necessarily preserved, which time, custom, and manners warranted in the original. Yet I defy you to find one passage, Mr. Marmaduke, one sentiment that will raise an unchaste passion or encourage immorality. But thousands of books are written, and the very one you have borrowed your idea from is an instance, without the least indelicate word, the sentiments of which are fit only to be read in a brothel. Nay, the most indecent book that ever was written in the English language is famous for the purity of the words, as no one is said to be found in the whole book that may be ranked under the term obscene. Marmaduke was quite astonished at this last remark, and determined, if possible, to remember it on some other occasion. But Whiffle would not let him off so easily. Marmaduke, said he, as you are so learned in the Bible, give us a critique, my good fellow. His opponent indignantly replied, Well, how came Joshua and the moon stand still? Smith and the rest burst into a violent laugh, but Whiffle, keeping his countenance, calmly replied, Oh, Marmaduke, Marmaduke, if you'd read the chapter before, you would have seen the reason at once. Don't you remember how Joshua travelled to the moon? Oh, yes, replied the hopeful Pendragon sharply. To be sure, I have read it, but I don't believe a word of the matter. The laugh was now ten times louder. The critic thought the laugh was at his wit and began joining in it, when Whiffle whose itch for punning could no longer be restrained, dropped all his gravity, and laying his hand on the other's jolly broad pate and shaking it gently like a mandarin's head, exclaimed, Power is my name, friend, and mar thy nature. Marry, thou art a most marvellous creature. The company re-echoed the laugh at Mr. Marmaduke's droll figure, who was so astonished he knew not whether he ought to be angry. But as there was no grain of heroism in his composition, he thought he had better not, so quietly let the rest laugh their fill. 
When it had pretty well subsided, Sims, with seeming simplicity, begged of Mr. Marmaduke as a favour to repeat some of the speech he had intended to make at Coachmaker's Hall. Marmaduke had at his chambers spouted away to Sims, whom he considered as little better than a fool, this speech which was to have been spoken. Sims, with his nice talent of mimicking, had caught all the laboured action of the other, and remembered great part of the speech. Marmaduke, conscious he should expose himself in the present company, declined it, alleging it was so long since that he had quite forgot it. Smith Sims professed himself so highly pleased with it, he had thought of nothing else, and retained great part in his memory, and if Mr Marmaduke had no objection he would try a little, though certain he would never do it justice. Marmaduke, flattered at the notice taken of it, did not object, and Sims began, borrowing at the same time that hat of the future barrister, an enormous cocked one, bought on the purpose for the lobby and Ranley. Sims first walked a little about the room, to catch the air and manners of Marmaduke, then getting rather behind the other, he begun. He might have sworn at the commencement of the speech that Marmaduke himself had spoken, but in a few sentences the caricature grew so strong that the applause of the company put a stop to the performance, and Smith fell into such paroxysms of laughter that he absolutely dropped off his chair. Marmaduke, who did not see the action, was the only one unmoved, and cared little about it, except that it was over. Gunpeng Dragon was so complete a coxcomb, so affected, so conceited, so self-opinionated, that he was the most proper object in the world for a subject of ridicule. He was of that species of vain coxcombs that your feelings were never hurt at seeing him ridiculed. Every man who knew him knew he deserved it, and it was only occasional sallies of this kind which kept his impudence within any bounds. I'll give you, reader, a short species on, of this cool impudence of his, specimen of this cool impudence of his. You may judge of the rest by the sample. When Marmaduke Pendragon Esquire first dashed up on the town, the youth thought proper to keep his fate in. It happened that he dined at a public meeting, where was a nobleman distinguished for his rank and abilities, but whom he had never seen before. The cloth was scarce removed when his grace casually mentioned that he proposed going to Richmond on the morrow, but had not determined how. I'll go there myself, Lord Duke, exclaimed the hopeful boy, joining in the conversation. I'd be extremely happy to drive you in my phaeton. It is unnecessary to add his lordship looked surprised and declined the offer. So much for the modesty and diffidence of Marmaduke. The next morning, as Smith and the others were at breakfast in the coffee room, a hackney couch drew up, and Marmaduke, with a handkerchief to his face, came out. As the room was filled with company, he desired to speak to Smith in another room. Then, taking the handkerchief away, he disclosed a very formidable black eye. Smith, inquiring the cause, he said that his servant was from home when he returned, and with the key of his chambers, that he fought him at the porter, found, sought him at the porter house, and finding him much in liquor and very saucy, had been tempted to strike him with his cane. The blow had been returned with interest. Not only so, but he had been summoned before a magistrate this morning for striking his servant and wish Smith and Whiffle would accompany him. Smith and Whiffle readily agreed. I'm not at all afraid, said the Marmaduke, of the issue, for the fellow I know has not got a sixpence. Smith only answered him with a smile, and they soon arrived at Bow Street. Two hackney coachmen were ready to swear to the assault, and besides alleged that Marmaduke Pendragon had attempted to draw a knife, which, but for their interference, had certainly taken place, and dreadful consequences might have happened. The black eye which our student of law exhibited, they swore Mr. Marmaduke had given to himself by rushing against the door. Poor Pendragon confessed that the men had interfered, but positively denied any idea of a knife, and declared he had received a violent blow from his man, whom he owned he had slightly struck with a small cane. This was sufficient for the magistrate, who told him he doubted not his story might be true, but as he had no evidence, and two appeared against him, he should be obliged to commit him to prison, and thus he produced proper bail. Smith and Whiffle offered, but were refused, not being housekeepers. Marmaduke, therefore, remained in custody, while Smith went for two of the family tradesmen who came and bailed him. The magistrate civilly wished to settle the business without bringing it into court, but the fellows who had agreed to share the spoil had before determined upon their plan. An attorney had taken up the business and introduced them to an eminent counsel. They stated to him the case, and he willingly undertook it on the terms of receiving, with the attorney, one moiety of the damages. Thus, for the present, rested the business, and Marmaduke had le leisure to reflect that a master could not strike his servant without his being able to get a chance of revenge, even if he had not sixpence in his pocket. What the end would be was not yet known. Mr Marmaduke Pendragon, 
according to his notion of the English laws, looked out for a cunning attorney, determined in his own case not to overlook the advantage of being a greater man than his adversary. The attorney gave him every hope of success, and two able counsel were immediately engaged. Damn it, replied young Pendragon. I did not think the fellow would do so much. This cursed business, I dare say, will cost me fifty pounds. But as for the fellow, he will be ruined. That's Paul's. Now at the porter house where the affray began was a very pretty girl to whom it was supposed both master and man paid their devoirs. Chapter 17. Epigraphs. Epigraph 1. Bid vice and folly take their natural shapes, turn duchesses to strumpet, bow to apes, drag the vile whisperer from his dark abode, till all the demon starts up from the toad. Pope. Second epigraph. Lothario on that stock which nature gave without a rival stands, though March yet lives. Churchill. While Smith remained in town, Marmaduke was with him most days. He prevailed on our hero and Whiffle to go with him to a debating society. Sims was otherwise engaged. The subject of debate was, which has most injured society, infidelity or enthusiasm? The defenders of infidelity carried everything before them. They had nine-tenths of the company on their side to condemn enthusiasm, a Marmaduke in a large tribe like himself repeatedly joined in a hoarse laugh at the artful and violent invectives with which poor religion was treated on account of her bastard brother. Her defenders, the opponents of infidelity on the contrary, could meet with very little attention, and the freedom of debate was never more abused than by these eager supporters of it. Thrice did Whiffle rise in defence of the good old dame, and thrice did our hero pluck him back by the coat. Smith, who well knew all his arguments would be thrown away, was afraid lest the loose wit of Whiffle should be the occasion of insults from any of the offended orators, and he happily restrained the impetuous punster. As they returned home, some of the harangues were asked by Marmaduke to, summer, to supper. Smith and Whiffle had before promised him their company. The subject of conversation among the self-illuminated at Mr. Marmaduke's soon turned upon the superior knowledge of the present day, which consenters in itself the wisdom of every foregoing era which proves and exemplifies the theories of the ancients. Happy, thrice happy, cried one of the orators, are we, modern philosophers, to have been born in an age of reason, when a wonderful perspicuity and even mathematical certainty pervades all the ranks of literature and expands every art and science. Since I have the honour to be in the company of such an enlightened set of philosophers, said our hero, I may conclude, gentlemen, that you can elucidate a subject which has largely created many doubts and many disputes among the literati, and many bets and many dinners among the illiterati. The philosophers were all attention. Our hero proceeded. Footnote. This is no imaginary subject of debate. Wise men from the palace to the change, from the members of C. Hall to the members of P., aristocrats and democrats, courtiers and citizens, soldiers, lawyers, physicians and divines, all of the very first eminence in their several stations and professions could be named who have taken up the gauntlet of controversy concerning the end of the 18th century. Back to the text. When does the 19th century begin? Every one of these men of universal knowledge contemptuously sneered at the very question. Huh, ridiculous, replied a master of subtle propositions. There is no matter for doubt. Assuredly, when the 18th has ended. I'm infinitely obliged to you, sir, said Smith, smiling. This I did know before. But when does the 18th end? At the very moment of time, replied the man of wisdom with the profoundest gravity, when this terrestrial globe, turning on its axis, forms with its diameter drawn from any individual and the solar luminary a straight line. The instant this line swerves from its straightness, what is commonly called the sun has passed its nadir, or philosophically speaking, the dear has passed the central solar beam. The new year commences to that individual. Well, your learning and comprehensive explanation, continued Smith, is doubtless, sir, uh, very edifying. But at the end of what year does this fraction of the straight line, diametrically drawn from you to the sun, begin your next century? Well, assuredly, when the year 1799 is completed. My dear friend, exclaimed another philosopher, you certainly mean the year 1800. Sir, I mean what I have said, 1799. I, who have written four large volumes on... If you've written 4,000, exclaimed a third, you could never make me believe... Sure, cried a fourth. In 1799, years have passed by. We've finished the 18th century. Damnation, what the devil do you mean? 
Can 1799 years make? The others calmly proceeded, regardless of the fury of his opponent. When I come to 1800, is it not sufficient? This I do at the end of the year, 1799. Citizens, can anything be more clear? Well, certainly not, replied the first, willing to close it with a simile. If I travel the moment I arrive at the hundredth milestone, I have been a hundred miles. Oh, by my soul, bawled the man of violence, you'll make me mad. I say it is contrary to reason, sense, learning, philosophy that 1799 can make 1800. My dear Rapid, said the first, hear me explain it to you. Oh, damn explanation, vociferated the other, once known by the name of Blast Rapid, Squire, now Citizen Rapid. I swear by all that's... My dear friends, exclaimed Moon Pendragon, my dear friends, trying to receive the tumult while Whiffle and Smith enjoyed and fermented the storm. The arts and sciences were never more completely at cross purposes, and the last of the whole set, the scientific researches of pugilism, had certainly concluded the argument, but for the inspiring powers which gratified the olfactory nerves from Mr. Marmaduke's supper, that luckily at this period made its appearance. Not Neptune himself in a storm, nor a favourite orator in a crowd could have been more successful. Not an enraged schoolboy at the fight of his master more suddenly calmed. At the sight of his master more suddenly calmed. Not a hempecked husband at the sound, sound of his mistress's voice more engrossed by the coming object. Now, yeah, sound has given place to the gratification of sense, replied Whiffle, as he helped one of the most loquacious to the wing of a boiled fowl and oyster sauce. A nod from the hungry orator realised the remark. It is a received aphorism that nothing will more conduce to allay the irascible appetites than the means of gratifying the carnivorous ones. Therefore, hunger and valour are synonymous. Had the English ministers at the commencement of the war with the French Republic been better philosophers, had they known this great truth, the affairs on the continent had undoubtedly taken a more favourable turn. Subsidising our allies was the very worst method we could have adopted. They soon became heavy, dull, cloyed, satisfied and useless. While the idea of starving our enemies was equally erroneous, it proved the provocative of their wit, the rouser of their spirits, and the grand incentive to their courage. Hunger, we are told, will eat through walls of brass, much less cold stones, could stones and mortar oppose it. It is to be hoped, then, if foreign subsidies are absolutely necessary to the British politics, that at another time we shall have learnt wisdom, and shall below, uh, bestow our loans, presents, and other superfluities on the enemy, as we are well assured they cannot be distributed to a worse purpose than they were in the last instance. Let the case before us suffice to prove it, instead of a volume on the subject. When the animal economy had been fully replenished by a liberal proportion of the moist as well as the dry nutriment, Mr M Pendragon, with that vacuity of thought which characterised the hopeful young man, came to a gentleman who in the debating society, whilst he calumniated enthusiasm, with all the ardour of a Billingsgate against an offending petit maître, Maitre had professed himself an enlightened philosopher. My dear Mr. Puzzlebrain, said young Pendragon in his simple way, don't you then really believe there is a heaven and a hell? Reason, reflection, knowledge all teach me, replied the orator, that when I once cease to be, I cannot again exist. And pray, sir, said Whiffle, now no longer to be restrained, what teaches your horse? For I conceive he had no more idea of future existence than his master. So, retorted another with a declaim, you absolutely believe in the stale story of another world. Pray, good sir, what do you see in my appearance more eternal than in any other of the living creatures of this earth? Oh, God forbid, sir, that I should judge of all mankind from you. Indeed, if I took you for a specimen, I should doubt a little. I suppose, said a third, shaking his head with a sneer. The gentleman feels a certain deficiency at present, and lives in the hope that he shall be better off hereafter. He humbly trusts that the vapour of his wit will be metamorphosed into the solidity of wisdom. But you, answered Whiffle, perhaps are not conscious of your deficiency, for I have heard it is a trait of folly to be ignorant of its wants. The voice of interest, not the voice of reason, said the first orator, meaning to attack that makes you fancy there's another world, and pride flatters you with the hope that your desert shall be rewarded. Well, sir, replied their general opponent, you, who are all modesty and candour by the same argument, find that it is your interest there should be none. With due diffidence and humility are conscious you do not deserve it. 
prima sinorbe deus fichit dimor, vociferated a new antagonist. Fear first made gods, and cowards are its worshippers. It is much more probable, said our hero, taking up the argument, that fear first endeavoured to reason itself into the belief that there was none. The wisdom of Voltaire has already elucidated the base and cowardly nature of superstition, retorted the man of learning. The courage of his infidelity, said Smith, I know he practically showed by his patience under the discipline of the Prussian officer's cane. But whether your idol's wisdom, sir, is in the sophistry of his argumentative, the falsehood of his historical, or the blunders of his philosophical works, I have yet to learn. Oh, the abilities of a Voltaire, sir, if I other, were not to be confined to your forms of trifles. Nor facts, nor truth, sir, continued Smith. But it is by reason, reflection on knowledge, that the libertine, the debauchee, and the criminal join the cry of the self-made philosopher and say there are no gods to reward or punish. Did reason, reflection, and knowledge so teach the learned sages of antiquity? Are the deep researches, the persevering inquiries of a Newton and a Locke to yield to the inspired learning of every declaimer who tells you himself that he's a clever fellow? Do, do, do you mean us, sir? said the whole tribe at once. Well, accordingly as you feel it, gentlemen, replied our hero. Let me tell you, sir, said one of the most violent, credulity is no sign of wisdom. I love the plain truth, and while I have life, will do my best to detect enthusiasm and error. By the same principle I conclude, said Wiffle, as the thief catcher detects the thief. <laughs> All pretended supernatural occurrences, sir, said Smith, giving Wiffle a look to be silent. Would you not willingly expose? Yes, said the orator. Yes, returned the whole gang. Then, gentlemen, continued Smith, I put to you a test. And taking a paper from his pocket, he read the famous advertisement of a well-known fortune teller. Do any of you believe the lady? They naturally answered in the negative. A large strain of invectives was now poured forth against the bold astrologist. When it had subsided, Smith calmly continued. Now, gentlemen, which of you are inclined to make the trial of this imposter? No one offered himself a volunteer in the task. One of the company at last said, why don't you detect her yourself? Well, I have never boasted myself a disbeliever of supernatural occurrences. And though I have no faith in the wonderful stories told of this lady, which you gentlemen must have heard, it will give me no manner of concern if she indeed has the knowledge she professes. But I think the man who propagates opinions against the experience of a superior governor should first show his wisdom by detecting a very glaring instance of the lowest kind that in the most public manner invites him, as it were, to the test. Now let us all go together and visit the lady, said Marmaduke. That is not to be done, replied Smith. She receives but one at a time, to whom she recapitulates some of the occurrences of their former life as a proof of her knowledge, and then foretells whatever remarkable is to follow, if the person wishes it, even to their death. Now, gentlemen, said you, our hero, as you are the champions of incredulity, here is an antagonist that bids you defiance. After all your professions, you shrink from the combat. One woman boldly professes the art of foretelling events by a supernatural knowledge of the influence of the starry bodies. She reigns alone, successful and triumphant, while a whole body of would-be philosophers assembling crowds abuse everything sacred and divine, compliment and praise the wisdom of one another, yet are unable to confute and detect the arts of a single, friendless female opponent. Our hero, not wishing to have any further altercation with these investigators of truth, took his leave of the company, and with his friend Whiffle proceeded to his lodgings. A few days after, Marmaduke, who was fond of showing his consequence, offered to introduce our hero to one of the most fashionable fairy tables. Smith told him it was a game he had never played at or wished to play. The other answered that made no difference, but that he would introduce him to the house, if Smith chose, where he was perfectly at liberty to play or not as he thought proper. I may have once introduced you to the mistress of the house, who, by the by, is not only a very intimate acquaintance of mine, but a very near relation. Be quite at home. Now, the card rooms will be all open to you, to look on or play. No notice will be taken by anyone. Your name will be down in Mrs. Lewis's book list. The persons by whom you are introduced, a very elegant supper will be at your service at one o'clock. The supper is always provided by the man who superintends the fairy bank, for the express purpose of Miss Lewis's friends, whether players or not. 
He makes this compliment to the lady and pays all the expenses of the evening for the use of her house and name. They tell me sometimes a handsome present besides. A scene of this kind was totally new to Smith. His curiosity induced him to gratify it, but he doubted the truth of Marmaduke's statement. We're full assuring him the lady really was a relation and that Marmaduke occasionally went there. Our hero no longer demurred. The novelty of this entertainment could not fail to gain his attention, and he made the commonplace remarks to himself, natural to a stranger. Though he had already indulged in so many habits of dissipation, yet he saw at once the immorality and even wickedness of this. How keen is the fight when custom has not dulled the edge of it? Is it possible, said our hero to himself, that my country is so depraved that a woman who can prostitute her name and sell in her family and connections to a set of wretches of this kind is still countenanced by the community in general, the people of fashion and family in particular? Marmaduke soon sat down to the fairy table. Smith did not attempt to play, but after supper, as he was looking on and trying to learn the peculiarities of the game, a gentleman who also stood by, for there were many, asked him if he would play a few hands at piquet. Smith, who knew the common games upon the cards very well, did not like to refuse, and they sat down together to play for half guineas. They played for about an hour, and Smith lost two guineas. The stranger soon after went away. Marmaduke left the fairy table when he perceived the piquet party was over, and to Smith's inquiries concerning his antagonist, informed him he was Lord Carmine. Smith knew that Lord Carmine was one of the most dashing men of the day, that he had the first horses on the turf and run his matches and gained for immense sums of money. He was therefore rather surprised that his lordship had condescended to play for so trifling a sum. Lord Carmine, unlike the general run of young noblemen, ventured upon the turf. From his first commencement, he had never been made a dupe of, and, as my friend Patrick and Neagle told me, was a veteran when he first began. The parts of his education which were most attended to were a proper and clear knowledge of the different fashionable games, the various deceits and impositions which are commonly practised upon the cards by designing and professed gamesters, and a perfect familiarity with the cards and games of the, and chances of the games. In the, pedigree of, if the, in the pedigree of horses, his lordship was much better versed than in his own. In the tricks of jockeys, stable boys, and the owners themselves, he had been thoroughly instructed. And so able had been his masters, so willing and ready to learn had been the pupil, that when he dashed forth in the great theatre of dissipation and gaming, with an unencumbered fortune of 30,000 a year, he had proved too deep, too well instructed for them all. Fly old practitioners and needy adventurers had more than once attempted to entangle him in their toils. Like a Samson, he snapped them asunder and left them the victims of their wiles. I will mention one instance, though nothing to my history, that will show his lordship's thorough acquaintance in the deep arts and mysteries of these modern Greeks. His lordship had an excellent young filly to run at Newmarket, which was the favourite. In the betting room, his lordship offered ten to seven upon the race. I'll take your thousands, said a fly old rogue, whose rook, whose experience, art and cunning were supposed to be the very first. His lordship wondered at the boldness of the offer, but instantly closed with it and soon after left the room. The race was to be on the morrow, and it was now late in the evening. Lord Carmine went directly to the stable where his filly was kept. The groom was in the act of going in when his lordship, taking the key and lantern, ordered him to go to the hotel and send his own gentleman. Mr Donaldson, said Lord Carmine, you will sleep in the stable with me tonight. I think you and I can make a very good groom and stable boy for one evening. In short, his lordship and his head servant were the only persons that approached the filly till she came upon the race course. They prepared her for the match, and Mr. Donaldson led her to the starting post. As the jockey was about to be weighed, Lord Carmine called for came forward and said, I shall ride her myself. Give me the cap. And stripping off his coat, stepped into the scales. He knew his own weight to an ounce and was but a trifle heavier than the jockey. His lordship rode remarkably well and exerted himself uncommonly upon this occasion the consequence of which was, he won the race. It is impossible fully to define, describe the confusion of the knowing black legs who thus lost vast sums. The old fellow who thought himself sure of winning was completely ruined. The jockey, whom Lord Carmine chiefly suspected, a few weeks after confessed the whole. He had been offered a thousand guineas to lose the race and had intended to give the horse improper food in the stable, or if no opportunity offered, to blow him in the running. The veteran of iniquity who had bribed the jockey and betted with Lord Carmen never afterwards was permitted to appear, 
and a great many of the fraternity who depended upon his skill for suck the turf, signalised themselves on the road and became the heroes of the Newgate calendar much sooner than their lot had otherwise destined them. Chapter 18 Yet my fate, so heaven in bounty please, still to be poor of blessings such as these. Horace sat one. Mr. Marmaduke Pendragon had a very particular friend, who, as well as himself, was a genius of no common caste. These young men were, in one respect, like Alexander the Great. Neither of them could well have borne an equal. It was therefore the dissimilarity of their tastes, manners, and persons that cemented their friendship. Mr. Le Pauper was the constant fighting swain, making an offer to every other woman he met, fond of all great people where the title and fortune made the greatness, and a regular attendance at every levy where he could get admittance. In his person, thin and meagre, so directly the reverse of Marmaduke, that two better foils to one another cannot be conceived. Family pride, Marmaduke, who was of good family, had none. The pauper, who knew not the Christian or even surname of his great-grandfather, idolised it, and heraldry was his only study. He also had been placed with an attorney, but his pride in vain attempted to make an eminent barrister of him, his grandfather had taken the name of Pauper from being brought up in the workhouse. At a very early age, he was employed by a great clothier in the parish, and step by step, rose to be in business for himself. With a clear head, he soon made his way in the world. He amassed a considerable property, and at the age of fifty, retired to a fine estate he had bought some years before. So great was the grandfather's hatred of the name of family, that he gloried in being called Pauper, and absolutely disinherited his eldest son, the father of the young man I'm mentioning for marrying a woman of one of the first families in the kingdom. After the old man's death, the second son inherited the estate, which from many additions was become of considerable value. The son had gained the favour of the father by affecting the same turn of mind, by living with him always in the country and frequently remarking that the nobility were the drones of society. But on his father's demise, a great change took place. He no longer concealed his sentiments, and an opportunity offered of making a good bargain, he purchased a baronetcy and by a trifling change became Sir James Le Pauper. This uncle was unmarried, and to his title and estates his nephew's ambition was directed. Proud of the expected baronetcy, in defiance of the common history of the family, which was known to all the neighbourhood, which the old man gloried in telling, he flattered himself greatly in his mother's alliance, and considered himself as equal to the first families in the country. The consequence of this may be easily supposed. He was neglected and despised by the more respectable, and openly laughed at and insulted by the commonality. In abilities, courage, learning, and knowledge, the two friends were nearly on a par. Monsieur Le Pauper, at this time, was gone off to Scotland with Lady Amelia, Amelia O'Brottle, a younger daughter of an Irish earl, and to sum up all her perfections of mind, person, and fortune, in one sentence she was nothing but a name. When the pauper returned from his matrimonial expedition, his friend Marmaduke determined to give a dinner at the temple. Smith, Whiffle and Sims were invited. It was fixed for the day before our hero left London, and they met La Pauper with two party friends of Marmaduke's, Mr Jakes and Mr Sneer, and a few young men of the temple. Jakes was one of those characters who, like Lackington, might have said, no time did I in education waste. Happily, I had an intuitive taste. Born and bred in the lowest station, the native powers of his mind dispelled the obscuring clouds that seemed to overwhelm him and forcing himself into notice, he trampled underfoot modesty, diffidence, distrust, doubt, and the other checks of genius. He had written plays, pamphlets, novels, and was concerned in many, per many periodical works, he was universally known, and boasted that he was a democrat and free thinker. Mr. Sneer was alike in principle, or properly want of principle, inferior in abilities, but cunning, sly, and plausible. He had received a finished education, yet was of that mean, despicable character that at school, at college, and in the habits of social life, he had been always avoided by every man of honour and respectability, of honest respectability. To get a name of some kind, he had set up for a friend of the people's. Happily for the people, all their friends are not like him. Our hero, who knew them both by sight and by reputation, looked very hard at Marmaduke, who, understanding his meaning, turned his head aside. Smith paused as he entered the room, and had half a mind to have left it, but his general habit of civility prevailed, and he determined neither to enter into political or religious subjects. Dinner was soon served up, and sooner over. Few words had passed from any of the parties. An Englishman, at his introduction among strangers, generally considers them with a suspicious eye, 
but if he knows that their principles are totally different from his own, he seems apprehensive of an attack every moment. The pauper was full of his own consequence, and thought no one of the company worth his regards beside Sims, whose independent fortune and valuable burrows he had heard of. He talked a little to him in a low voice concerning his great marriage and expectations, while the other alternately regarded his gait, tone and manners as fit objects of future ridicule. Marmaduke had as yet yet given none of his toasts. He was somewhat in awe of our hero and feared the wit of Whiffle. But Jakes began to him. Success to the cause of liberty all over the world. The company in a bumper showed their approbation. Jakes began a fine rhapsody on liberty, seemed at once to consider himself as toastmaster and gave another. Freedom to the human mind from the shackles of religion. Filling his bumper, he began a second duration, lamenting that while all other animals of the earth enjoyed this old glorious freedom, man alone was the slave to the thoughts, manners and appetites of others of his own species. Whiffle irritated, for he was designed for the church. And seeing an opening for his favourite play on words, instantly replied, At least a shackle, sir, I wish not to be without. I have no desire to make an exchange for the mental endowments of any brute, however respectable he may be. I envy not the independent thoughts of that noble animal, the wolf. I have no ambition for the easy and free manners of the bear, or I have any, nor have I any longing for a canine appetite. Sneer, with a look of contempt at Whiffle for his affectation of wit, was preparing to cut him most unmercifully, when Smith addressed himself hastily to Pendragon. Mr. Marmaduke, I bet we have no, I beg we have no politics or divinity. These subjects will only occasion disputes. Come, give us a lady. Sneer contemptuously remarked that hmm, those who have the weaker cause are generally glad to give up the argument. Smith made no answer. Jake slipped defiance and grinned, and Marmaduke toasted some noted demi-rep. The first clash between the modern Oxonians and independents was thus pretty well over. Jakes threw himself back in a chair as if despising the trifling minds of the company, and Sneer addressed himself to his sapient host with... Well, Mr. Marmaduke, are we to talk of fashions, of dogs, of horses? Since these gentlemen will not the veil of falsehood remove from their eyes. This was spoken with so supercilious an air that Sims could not resist an inclination to imitate it. The rest, and even the inanimate, Le Pauper burst from a stifled laugh. The man of wisdom perceived he was the object of ridicule, and haughtily continued. <laughs> My sacred love of truth, sirs, despises the scoffs and taunts of the ignorant. And while I profess myself to be her disciple, I will, if occasion offers, glory in being her martyr. Uh, second Vanini, upon my honour, said Smith, but are you assured, my good sir, that what you call truth, the rest of us would allow to be such? I care not replied the philosopher, for what is commonly called the rest of the world. I follow reason, learning, knowledge. I see, said Smith, smiling. The cant is the same with you all. You mean your own reason, your own learning, your own knowledge. Mine, I trust, is far different, but since, sir, you care not for the rest of the world, the rest of the world may perhaps pay you the same compliment, and what you call truth may be in their eyes no other than falsehood. But when you despise the sentiments of others, you should at least learn not to intrude your own. Is a man of my years, replied Mr. Sneer, to learn from the innate prejudices of youth? This would be indeed dancing to a pretty tune. I take your illusion, most learned sir, that Socrates, when he knew everything else, learned to dance in his old age. But I perceive you are a great way from a Socrates, if you cannot even command your temper. And I shrewdly suspect, if you follow his example, that your dancing days will not soon arrive, and that you will never be able to cut a caper to any tune. The philosopher put on a feigned smile of contempt and deigned not to reply. Marmaduke, at no time very wise, now clearly saw his error in bringing such different characters together. His intention had been, by the eloquence of his party friends, to astonish and confute his Oxford ones, as they, who have been amazed at the tricks of a conjurer, fancy others have the same taste as themselves. A long silence ensued, which Mr. Lepaupe broke by some foolish question to Marmaduke concerning the pedigree of his family, then veered round to his late noble connections and ended with a dull, formal panegyric on hereditary honours. Jakes could not remain silent when such a subject was started. 
Honours, titles and distinctions are but baubles at the best, said he. But when they're handed down to succeeding generations, they're like an old tawdry suit of clothes, which, though they may have fitted the first possessor, hang but loosely on his successors. And as a merry Andrew in his patched jacket, see the wearer becomes. Every man of sense, an object of ridicule and contempt. The man, replied our hero, who rises by his own virtues, is undoubtedly superior to him who only borrows from his forefathers. Yet the honours that are derived from our ancestors are surely to be respected and commended as the continuation of our esteem for the original. If we reward a person with a sum of money, the property goes on to his posterity. Why then should not honours also be hereditary? Does any man benefit us our gratitude and goodwill we continue to his family? Has he been a kind friend or relation, and not our affections for his sake placed upon his offspring? And when the community think proper to confer titles and honours of any kind, why should our goodwill perish with the possessor, be born torn from his posterity? Besides, the favour is increased by the continuation of it to those most beloved, most dearly allied to him. Ties of blood, replied Sneer, are only weak links of an old chain of oppression which makes one person dependent on another so the tyrant is called father of the people the french have happily seen the fallacy of these distinctions and the weak fetters have perished with the greater ones slow and contemptuously the philosopher spake Whiffle saw an opening and thus replied pardon me sir we're not correct the French may have no ties of blood, they have bloody ties in abundance. And though the regular chain of parental dependence might be destroyed, they have forged a much more galling one in its place, with no weak links indeed, but nevertheless of the relative kind. I mean that gripping chain of fraternisation. My arguments, sir, said the indignant democrat, soar high above the shafts of your pertness. In truth, said Whiffle, they are very light. The grapes, cried the disputant with a note of exultation, which the fox cannot reach, he can easily call sour. The arrows of my folly, replied Whiffle, will reach, I believe, to your owl. And every magpie, added Jake's laughing at his own retort, can screech at the eagle, though few can fly along with him. Now birds of any note, continued Whiffle, seldom fly in couples. No screech owls and such like who cannot bear the light often fly in pairs. Your knowledge of natural history, answered Sneer contemptuously, I may venture to say is not very great. By yours, on the contrary, said Whiffle, who, like poor Cram, was unable to resist the temptation, seems to have enough of the natural for us all. I contend not with the imbecile force of a pun. There, sir, you are right, for ridicule, I've heard, is the test of sense. And pray, Mr. Oxonian, said Jakes, with an insolent and pointed laugh. <laughs> What's the test of impudence? Oh, that's a home question I allowed you. I allow you, replied the punster. Therefore, you can answer it best yourself. Jakes seemed not to relish his antagonist's manner of disputing, and Discord had begun to clap her wings when Smith once again attempted the mediator, and another toast, general, attractive and conciliating, restored harmony to all parties. Marmaduke pushed his bottle round very quick, and the Gallic politicians, perceiving the enemy like the Parthian could shoot flying, did not seem so eager to renew the combat. Sneer indeed once attempted in the high, flourishing speech to compare the situation of this country and France to the Carthaginian state at the end of their second war with the Romans, and was hastening our ruin very fast, when Whiffle stopped him short by remarking, not that he understood Mr. Sneer, had not delighted in Punic wars or Roman infallibility. After a few bumpers, all parties became more social, sociable, and Jake showed himself possessed of a wonderful fund of general knowledge. I'm astonished, sir, said Smith to him in the course of the evening, that a man so well informed as you are should plague yourself and others with such violent notions on politics and metaphysics. And to tell you the truth, replied Jake's whisper, I could never get into notice. Upon my life, I could get no employment till I handled these subjects pretty uh, smartly. Now I've got plenty, but since we don't go the fame road, you shall have no more. The pauper joined very little in the conversation, but evidently showed that he considered himself as superior to the major part of the company. An occasional toss of the head, an unmeaning sneer, gave the true index of pride and folly. A hint or two of this sort was not disregarded by Whiffle, who, remarking also that he began to refuse his wine, hinted to Smith that he would do his best to give his pride a fall before they parted. 
He drew his chair nearer to him and winking to the others said, Oh, come, Miss Lepore, but you have not favoured us with your conversation for some time. What say you to this, that excellent toast, the honour of nobility? My good sir, replied Lepore, I have drank enough wine, but I cannot refuse that toast, and instantly took off his bumper. You look thin, sir, continued Whiffle in a tone of pity. Since I had last the pleasure of meeting you with my friend Marmaduke, I don't think you have drunk enough wine. Well, my physician, replied the consequential Lepore, advises me not to drink more than a bottle at a sitting. And I think I have had my quantum. I am afraid you take medicines, Wiffle gravely asked. I have, and the other, taken a, a few slight things lately. Wiffle deliberately shook his head. Sims drew his chair back to hide a smile, and the rest of the company, pleased at this attack upon a haughty, pompous aristocrat, were all attention, but at a loss at what Mr. Wiffle meant, who calmly proceeded. Mr. Lepore, do you know many sturdy old physicians? But I can't say I do, replied the other. No, said Wiffle with a sigh. Physicians in general look old at fifty and die, the most healthy of them, at three score. But, Mr. Le Pauper, wishing a lively tone, do you know no jolly old fellows who enjoy their glass freely in defiance of three score? No. Well, plenty, said he. Plenty, reckoned the rest of the company. Then, Mr. Le Pauper, continued Whiffle in the tone of a man who had satisfied another, if physic only hastens old age, and good wine, while well, it cheers the heart, enlivens the soul, preserve the body sound and hearty, which is best, my young baronet. Ooh, wine, 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 <laughs> hallooed Le Pauper himself, among the best of them. Well, then throw physic to the dogs and fill a bumper to the good old toast, cried Whiffle. When sickness raises a storm, may the stomach vessel find a good port. Le Pauper, in high spirits, drank off a glass. Now, Sims, cried Wiffle, give us your wine song, Sims began. Wine cures the gout, etc., etc. Very little more was necessary to complete the overthrow. Wiffle talked nonsense to him as fast as his tongue could go. One instance cut him up, then punned upon him, then flattered him, gave him titles and honours without mercy. And I write poetry, said Wiffle. I will dedicate it to your lordship. Will you not patronise me? Oh, certainly, said the pauper. Hail thou second Macedus, as with his right hand extended he addressed him. I seen us at harvest, etc., etc. In short, the pauper, gudgeon-like, most easily swallowed the tempting bait of flattery, and was quickly tickled out of any will of his own. Nature, my dear baronet, it will certainly meant you for a philosopher. Many of the principles I perceive are innate in you, particularly the chief, the study of quality and obedience to all powers. Again, you are undoubtedly a mathematician properties and effects are sure to meet with your notice. You believe in magnitudes, your very heads are superficies, your minds a vacuum, and your whole person a good definition of a straight line, the longitude without the latitude. You prove yourself an astrologer by the reverence with which you contemplate stars and other luminous bodies, are well versed in the knowledge of their names, and you study their benign aspect, their places and their influences, and even now you're looking out for the consequence. Footnote. Consequence in astrology is when a planet moves in natural succession. End of footnote. All this stuff was lost upon the pauper himself, but Jake's sneer and the rest enjoyed it. A party was proposed to Vauxhall and as instantly acceded to. Two coaches were called and all the company except our hero and Mr. Sneer set off. Sneer was so intoxicated that he was unable to speak and staggered home. And our hero went again to Mrs. Lurie's, determined to try his luck at Pharaoh as far as the small sum of twenty guineas would go. The pauper was confused and could not walk without assistance. Wiffle and Jakes led him between them. Now, my young nobleman, said the former, you cut a very honourable appearance. Now, why so? Oh, because your arms have got supporters. They supped in the gardens. Wiffle's high tide of spirits was afloat, the more active, though less talkative. Sims most ably seconded him. Marmaduke's portion of wit was expelled by the wine, and folly reigned triumphant. Jake's harangued, hallooed, and spouted away till he had got a number of idlers round the box. The Templars laughed and applauded every word he spoke, while the pauper, with an idiot grin, sat in the middle of the group like the unmeaning figure of an Egyptian idol with its raving priests and enthusiastic adorers. Jake's was too public a character not to be known by a great part of the company. Many of them also knew the pauper and were surprised to see him just married in such a state and with such a companion. 
The following morning, one of them, a relation of his ladies, called upon him and kindly refreshed his memory with the occurrences of the evening. Lady Amelia had been before greatly shocked at the state in which her husband had been brought home, and this gave the finishing blow to her confusion. Never was a conceited, self-sufficient coxcomb more completely humbled. My lady gave him a look almost of contempt. His honourable kinsman said something like pity, while poor Le Pauper attempted an apology for his conduct by throwing the blame on his friend Marmaduke and professing himself ignorant of the company. In this state were things when Mr Marmaduke himself called. All their voices were directed against him. He took the quickest and best leave he was able, heartily sorry for every circumstance that had happened, and firmly determined in his own mind when he next gave a dinner to follow the old adage and let birds of a feather flock together. End of the second volume.